Silence, please. The Royal Commission is now in session. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to everyone who is present in the hearing room in Alice Springs and to all those who uh, are following the proceedings on the live stream. This is the third day of public hearing 25 of the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation <coughs> of People with Disability. And at this hearing, uh, we are examining the operation of the NDIS for First Nations people with disability in remote and very remote uh, communities. Uh, I shall ask uh, Commissioner Mason to make the acknowledgement of country. Thank you, Chair. What a, we acknowledge the Aranda people as the original inhabitants of the traditional lands on which we are gathering today, the Bancho, also known as Alice Springs. We acknowledge their ongoing spiritual and cultural connection to Mabantua. We acknowledge and pay our deep respect to elders past and present. We extend that respect to all First Nations people and acknowledge their enduring connection to land, sky, seas and waterways. We pay our deep respect to First Nations people here today and who are following this public hearing online on the mainland and on islands, including in the Torres Strait, especially elders, parents, young people and children. So Wanjajuda with disability. Today, we are joined by witnesses giving evidence from Broome and Fitzroy Crossing in Western Australia. We acknowledge the Banaba, Kunayandi, Nikina, Walmajari and Wanka Jungwa peoples of the Fitzroy Valley. And we acknowledge the Yarrow people of Broome. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Commissioner Mason. Um, those who are in the hearing room will uh, know that there is some wonderful artwork that is being displayed. Prior to uh, commencing the taking of evidence uh, this morning, I would like to express uh, our very sincere thanks uh, to the uh, Bindi Muranta artists, as well as the uh, <coughs> Bindi Muranta studio for providing this room with the artworks that uh, you can see or those in the, in the room can see at present. For those who may not know, uh, Bindi uh, Muranta uh, studio provides a means for Aboriginal artists with disability to develop and receive recognition for their artistic practices by providing supported studio spaces, a national exhibition schedule, design contracts, multimedia collaborations, art fairs, and art, war, art award opportunities. One uh, particular artwork uh, by the Bindi uh, Muranta artists, which you can see directly behind me, is by Adrian Jangala Robertson, and the piece is titled Yelpura Kinu. Uh, Adrian won the Ellis Prize this year and is a finalist for the Hadley's Art Prize in Tasmania. He was also a finalist in the very prestigious Sulman Prize that uh, is on show right now in Sydney. The Sulman Prize, as I'm sure many people know, is awarded for the best uh, subject painting, genre painting or mural. For those who uh, haven't been able to uh, participate in the proceedings in the Elder Springs hearing room, um, and as you may already have seen, the artwork of uh, the artists uh, will be displayed on the live stream during adjournments for the duration of this uh, public hearing, that is for the rest of this week. So again, our thanks to the artists for the privilege of uh, having their artwork displayed in the hearing room uh, during the course of uh, this week. Yes, Mr. Griffin. Thank you, Chair. As mentioned by Commissioner Mason, today the Royal Commission will hear evidence from five First Nations people with lived experience of disability and one First Nations organisation from the Fitzroy Valley in Western Australia. 
the Fitzroy Valley is a collection of connected communities covering an area of the central southern Kimberley of Western Australia. It's the home to five predominant language groups and there are at least 45 distinct communities within the valley. And you'll see on the screen a map of the Kimberley region and particularly the locations of Broome, Derby and Fitzroy Crossing and then across to Halls Creek. Fitzroy Crossing is the service town for the Fitzroy Valley and is situated on the banks of the Fitzroy River around 400 kilometres east of Broome with a population of around 1,300 people. Can I indicate that data produced by the NDIA to the Royal Commission recently indicates that in Fitzroy Crossing, there are 183 First Nations participants with active plans during the 2000-2001 financial year. 152 First Nations participants who received payments against their plans. Preliminary analysis by the data team at the Disability Royal Commission suggests that Fitzroy Crossing participants in the NDIS are not utilising their full plan funding It suggests that participants' spending is on average 28.4% of their committed supports. And most importantly, that 31 participants have not spent anything from their plan. Plan utilization is consistently lower across all age groups, irrespective of First Nation status when compared to what appears to be the national average. As I indicated, commissioners, it is a preliminary analysis by the data team within the Royal Commission. And after this public hearing, there will be an opportunity for the commission to liaise with the Commonwealth in terms of making submissions on any of these matters. But I wish to raise these matters this morning to give you commissioners an understanding of the context in which the evidence today can be placed. The first witnesses you'll hear from and the ones I'll call immediately, Jeff Davis and Marmajin Hand. I understand Marmaji will make an oath and Jeff an affirmation. Before that happens, can I indicate, Commissioners, that these two witnesses currently have three young men in their care, Tristan, aged 23, Tylon, aged 18, and Quaden, aged 16. Each of these boys have been diagnosed with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, known as FASD. Mamaji has provided a statement for this public hearing dated the 4th of July, 2022, identity number STAT.0567.0001. This statement is in the hearing bundle number A at tab 39. Jeff Hand has provided provided a statement for this public hearing dated the 15th of June, 2022, ID number STAT.0555.0001.0001. This statement is in hearing bundle A, tab 40. I'll hand over to your Associate Chair for the swearing of the witnesses. Yes, thank you very much. Um, can we see the witnesses on screen, is that to happen? It is intended that they would be on screen. All right, well, we'll just give it a moment uh, to bring up the picture.
Ah, we can see you now. Thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission to give evidence. Thank you very much for providing the statements. I hope it's okay if I call you Jeff and uh, Mamanji. Is that okay? Absolutely. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you to both of you for uh, your assistance to the Commission, and we're looking forward to uh, hearing your evidence today. Now, I understand, Mamanji, you wish to take an oath, so what I would ask you to do is to follow the instructions of my associate uh, who will administer the oath. And then, Jeff, I understand you wish to take an affirmation. My associate will then administer the affirmation to you. And if you don't mind, just follow her instructions. Thank you. Mamanji, I will read you the oath. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you, Mom and G. Jeff, I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, Jeff. Um, this, I'm sure, has been explained to you, but just to be clear, um, I'm obviously in the Ellis Springs hearing room. With me is Commissioner Mason, who is on my left, and on my right is Commissioner McEwen. We are the three commissioners who are participating in this hearing. Uh, I will now ask Mr Griffin, who is Senior Counsel assisting the Royal Commission, to ask you some questions. Thank you very much. Chair, before I ask any questions, can I indicate that Mr Hodge, Senior Counsel representing the Commonwealth, is present in the hearing room today? Yes, thank you, Mr Hodge, for uh, gracing us with your presence today. And can I indicate that before I ask Mamanji or Jeff any questions, we have a very short video to play of Tristan talking about his gardening business. My name is Tristan. I run a business called Tristan's Yard and Bird Maintenance. I do rubber snipping, I do mowing, I do rigging up, I do chainsawing, I cut all the trees and put it into a bonfire. I do lots of places around here. I do the courthouse. I mow at Baylor School and Fitzroy School. I just make all the place look tidy around here. I look outside my, my door and it's like, oh man, the grass is so long, I just want to cut it. <laughs> I must eat cut grass because it's very important because you don't know what's in it. If you're working with barefoot, there must be snakes. The situation is a good long to make it even and I cut it really low to make it really nice so people can see what's in the grass and to make it safe. If you want your grass to be cut, I'm the guy to call. <laughs> we have to take good care of the equipment and just looking out for my gear. I check the blades on the mowers and the filter and the fuel and the oil. When I garden, it's, it's really good for me. It's, it's really clear in my mind and my stress goes right down. It's getting me healthy. It's, it's really good for my muscles. And if you don't like the sun too much, that's, that's your bad luck. No one can ever survive in this heat, but I can. I like to be my own boss because it's really good and they listen to me. About four people work for me. I like running my own garden business and I just can't get enough of it. I do take good care of this place and people respect me a lot. So when they come to me, 
I wanted to be perfect. I wanted to be really good. I worked really hard for that. Well, the picture of cousin gardening is looking pretty good because it's me. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Griffith. Ma Mamanji, I wonder whether you might give the Royal Commission a little bit about your background, firstly your educational background and also your family background. Um, I guess um, I grew up at Fitzroy Crossing, went to school at Fitzroy, um, at the old mission school. Uh, I completed my um, high school at Derby Junior High, and then went down to um, Applecross Senior High School in Perth, uh, completed. Um, I went to year 11 and then decided to, uh, to leave school and then return back to Fitzroy and uh, got a job as a teacher right at the Fitzroy, Fitzroy, high, uh, Fitzroy School. You've been involved in <clears throat> and continue to be involved in, in many community organisations within Fitzroy Valley? Um, <clears throat> um, upon returning to Fitzroy, I got involved with um, the Adult Education Centre here, Gutta Yearly, um, was a lecturer there. Um, also, the Fitzroy Valley Aboriginal Sporting Association, because I love sports, and um, Mani Wandi. Um, organization, um, the founding member of Manin, and also um, was involved with the um, Marawara um, organization in the old days um, when um, the community development program was around. And then lately um, got involved with um, where my mum came from or was born um, on the desert, um, Yarani Jara, which is a prescribed body corporate. And also um, involved with the um, football here at, um, Fitzroy. Gandu. And oh, another one is Gandra um, Regional Organization, which is a, a sport and rec body. You have a master's degree in Indigenous, indigenous Languages. Yeah, I just recently um, finished my um, master's in um, Indigenous um, Languages um, out of Sydney Uni. And it took, um, I think it took me four years to complete it, but other than that, I, I managed to complete it in April of this year. And you've had a lifelong interest in language. I beg your pardon? You've had a lifelong interest in language. Oh, I have because um, when I, um, my own language was my first language, which is my mum's language. And um, not knowing and understanding in English, uh, I guess, um, you know, my own language was my first language and really interested because my mum actually spoke um, seven different um, Aboriginal languages. So uh, my interest has always been in my own language. And cu currently I am, uh, I coordinate the Aboriginal languages program in our school. And you mentioned you've had an involvement with sport. In fact, you're the president of the Central Kimberley Football League. Um, yes, I am. Um, I work very closely with my husband or my partner, Jeff, in relation to getting football, um, you know, off the ground here in the valley. And we have um, been running the football now for the last 20 years. Um, and in the last four years, the women actually came on to start playing um, Australian rules football. And it's really great to see uh, young women and, um, you know, some older women out there playing um, football. And 20 years suggests that you know how to keep that mob under control, Mamaji. <laughs> <laughs> we try to. It's sometimes teacher. very... I suppose um, being a, a teacher, you try and control, but sometimes, you know, it, a lot of things do happen that's beyond our control. So we try to manage as best we can. And you and Jeff have been together for 30 years. Um, yes, we have. Can I go to you, Jeff? Can you tell the commissioners a little bit about your background, um, particularly in relation to your time in Fitzroy Valley? Uh, well, I was uh, born and raised in Manjum up in the southwest of uh, WA. <clears throat> from graduating from Teachers College, I went to Jigalong. 
and spent my, uh, a year there and um, first came across working with Indigenous people there and, and um, found that it was uh, a very enjoyable experience. Um, in the early 80s, I went to, uh, I was a school teacher for six years and I ended up in Kununurra. Um, and then from there, I got involved in the sport and rec industry and that's where I first bumped into Mumaji. Um, I got a job back in Broome in the uh, in early 90s and uh, we set the Gander organisation up. And during that time, I was I travelled extensively throughout the Kimberley, uh, visiting remote communities and, and uh, assisting them set up their sport and recreation activities and, and uh, training and all that sort of stuff. Um, I moved from Broome to Fitzroy in 95 uh, to be with Mumaji and her family. And, uh, yeah, basically I've been there ever since. Does 25 years qualify you as a local? Uh, I'd say about 30%. <laughs> and we just saw a video of Tristan. He seems a delightful and very popular young man yeah, around Fitzroy. Is that right? Uh, yes, Tristan's challenged in lots of ways. That, that video was most probably the pinnacle, I, I think, of, for showing how he, he deals with things. Um, he's a delightful young man who uh, mostly has the best moral compass of anybody that I've met, um, but he's quite significantly challenged in lots of ways. And uh, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure in actually being able to uh, raise the kid. Um, we've raised him since he was basically since he was let, let out of hospital because he was very premature. Um, Mum and G looked after him and, and made sacrifices. <coughs> Excuse my my voice. Um, in the early days, uh, she uh, took time off to be with Tristan to assist in um, raising him because he had significant issues when he was very young. Um, but I think with uh, a fair bit of love and care and attention and stuff like the kids, the kids um, developed into a, a fine young man. But he's still challenged by lots of the issues that are, that his brain damage through al fetal alcohol has caused. I'll come back to that a little later, Jeff. But Mamaji, do you also have Tylon and Clayton, your grandchildren, yeah. under your care? Um, we do. Um, yeah, Tylon actually came to us um, when he was um, nine months old. Um, because the relationship that my son and her partner was having were very toxic, so the um, the grand um, the is grandparents of um, um, they basically said, look, you need to take this child. So we just took on um, um, Thailand, um, and then the other young fella, Quaden, came to our care when he was eighteen months old. So you know we had forged. We were looking after four children, including um, Tristan's older sister, who was also living with us at that time. So um, I guess um, for me, in taking on four children, because I had this uh, plan that I didn't have, you know, my youngest, um, my, my son didn't live with us and he no longer lived with us. So I had this planned life that I was going to go and do lots of stuff and I had to look after four children. And each of those children had quite complex needs. Um, they, yes, the, 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 the four of them have, and they've got very complex needs. And, um, and each and every one of, each one of them um, shows different behaviours. And that's what um, both Jeff and I had to, I guess, live with and, and trying to manage the best way we can to support these young, you know, these four young people who lived with us. And mind you, we only had a two bedroom house and we tried to manage to have those um, four children living with us. Was it your concern, Mamaji, that those children may have been removed from the community if you and Jeff didn't step in? Well, what I guess with, um, it, it came to us when um, Tristan actually was, um, when he was born, and, and my sister um, uh, took him um, 
Chipu, that's when um, the uh, Department of Community Services at that time and saw that um, my sister sort of um, neglected my, you know, um, Tristan and this is um, when they were going to uh, remove Tristan um, from my sister and placed him in, in care. And is it the fact that based on your experience, when children are removed from remote communities, they often suffer complex trauma? Um, yes, they do. Um, you know, it depends on what institution our young people are put in and there are all sorts of traumas that affect our children, you know, the loss of culture, the loss of um, connection with family, you know, with the home life um, and, and trying to adjust, um, you know, when they do come back, it's, it, it, it brings up all these trauma, trauma that they may have faced um, living in institutions or in, you know, in someone, uh, in someone else's care. And you and Jeff, I take from your statement, have a very strong view that family and community is the best location for people with complex needs, if it's possible. Um, yes, um, and if, um, if the support mechanism is put in place, similar to what we have done for Tristan, you know, really the, uh, the, um, the care that we placed around um, Tristan, I mean, we had to... Um, you know, because we love the young, we love the little, um, the young man there. And I guess, um, you know, keeping my family in place together, that he was being raised in where all his family are, you know, both from my side as well as his father's side, and that he had connection, you know, to his own country here in, in Fitzroy. And that's the most important things that we need to, you know, have these um, care um, for our children than the best best care. Can I look, look, yes, just add there um, the 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 way it works for Indigenous people? And I, I can only speak for around Fitzroy, but it's all around family, and there's a bit of a conundrum because um, with the the trauma and stuff that's been around for a long time since colonisation, there's a there's that intergenerational trauma that exists within families and the, the reaction of a lot of people to deal with that trauma is to hide it or to, you know, sink it with drugs or alcohol or, you know, those sort of things. And so, therefore, quite often the people who are most responsible in the family to make that family work uh, compromise themselves and so the kids become um, traumatised because of the trauma that's been passed down from you know, previous experiences of the parents or the grandparents and so the there is a sort of an imperative that you have to remove the kid from the dysfunction that's happening in the home but in actual fact because the family is the actual core logic of how the people exist it's, it's so important in Indigenous culture that it, family is everything. Um, and, that, and, that, and that's how the whole system operates. If that breaks down, then you take the kids away, it actually exacerbates the problem. So it's a sort of a conundrum because you've got dysfunction in the family already that's causing the kids to be traumatised again. You take them away to try and get them away from that trauma, it actually re-traumatises them by removing them from the environment that actually mostly could, if it was set up properly and if it was operating well, could support that kid. And I think Tristan is a good example of that where we as a family are able to keep him with us um, which has enabled him to exist within the family structures, even though they're quite dysfunctional in some ways, because there is a, there is a sort of a modicum of uh, love and support that is provided to him that enables him to have the base to be able to exist where, you know, his, his, his um, the siblings and other people are, are suffering from, you know, things like, uh, mental illness or trauma or you know, suicidal thoughts or those sort of things. He hasn't been able to survive in that. Whereas I think if we took him out of that, it would then expose him even more to the issues that he already faces. 
If I'll come back to that issue and particularly your concern of what happens to people like Tristan if you're no longer there and your thoughts about different models which may be explored. But before I do that, can I just ask you, Mamaji, in relation to fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, that was a condition you were completely unaware of, I understand, until Tristan <coughs> and his sister came. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I've got, I, I, you know, I say my two children, my own two children were normal, they had normal birth then, and, you know, the normal growth of any um, young human being that we bring into the world. Then uh, when Tristan came into our care, I've noticed that there were, uh, I mean, um, at the age of um, five months old, he um, contracted in um, hydrocephalus where he, we had to, he had to get flown into Perth and um, got put a, a shunt um, which drains the fluid out of his uh, brain. Um, so when I took him up to the pediatrician, uh, Dr. Um, Adams, he told me then, I said, are you aware about um, the uh, spectrum disorder, the uh, alcohol spectrum disorder? And I said, no, I'm not aware of um, you know, this condition at all. So I guess um, my first um, hearing about the, um, the whole, um, you know, the FASD was when I went to a, I went to um, for a, a professional development in Perth and I just happened to um, go to a symposium where Dr. Uh, Professor Elliot was speaking and that's when all the um, things that I heard sort of tweak and I said, well, these are the same conditions that I saw in young Tristan and also um, the young, you know, the Rani. Uh, Rani, you know, she was displaying the same sort of behaviours. And not only that, as being a practising teacher, I saw behaviours like that within the classroom where things that couldn't, um, you know, kids who were attending 100% but couldn't put things in the right um, way. So all of these things started to, um, you know, click and then when I um, started becoming involved in the Little One um, project and went across to Canada um, and attended some of the conference on um, fetal alcohol disorder, um, then I started to realise that our community and our children um, were suffering from this particular condition or disorder. So from early 2000s, you started to self-educate in relation to this particular disorder. And then I understand between 2009 and 2015, there was the little one, L-I-L-W-A-N study conducted in the crossing, is that right? Yes, it was a prevalence study, which um, um, uh, tested quite a number of our children at that certain age group. And what were the conclusions of that study as to the prevalence of this particular disorder within your community? Uh, sorry, I can't <laughs> I couldn't what, hear um, what the question what were, what were the conclusions of the Little One study into this disorder in your community? Well, um, according to the study, um, when, when uh, it was completed and, and there was a... Um, uh, when it came back to Fitzroy, I think 20%, I'm not, I think that was um, children were on, on the spectrum out of the cohort. And I think there was about 199 children who went through that um, particular study. Now that study concluded in 2015. To your knowledge, did the NDIA pick up the results of that study to incorporate it into the NDIS when it was established? Oh, I can't, um, to honestly, I can't really uh, make a comment on that because um, I wasn't aware. The only one was from um, when Tristan was already on, on a plan here with the WA Disability Commission and when 
And when the rollout of NDIS came, whether his old stuff went across to NDIS, uh, that's the only experience that I can say honestly about, you know, the rollout of that particular program and who were actually on, on, on the program. Only from our own experience, I could, um, you know, say that, you know, that what impact it had on, on Tristan's. Thank you. If I could make a, a comment there, um, Tristan um, was identified by his daycare gang as somebody having significant issues and <laughs> he needed extra care at daycare because of the, some of the things that were happening at daycare with his behaviour and stuff like that. Um, and the ladies that were involved then were very knowledgeable and actually... Uh, got him registered in the state system to get support for him at uh, daycare. <clears throat> to do that, there was um, a number of uh, reports that had to be written that almost had to exaggerate his conditions to attract funding to enable them to have somebody uh, work with him at daycare. Now, they were successful in getting that care and that rolled into then his some care given to him at school. Um, but again, it was the same situation. When he was evaluated, they almost had to um, um, give the worst case scenario for him to attract funding. Um, he was uh, with the state system um, via the, the fact that the school and us and daycare and everybody had sort of pushed the, we, we knew about how it worked and that he needed that uh, care, but there were significant other groups of kids um, and I'd imagine they're part of this 20 to 30% that appeared in the FASD study that were affected by, uh, and on the spectrum that weren't able to access the same services because the, the people didn't have the same knowledge and experience and background that we had. Just... And then the, the, the role, the, as Mumaji pointed out, the, the transition between uh, being on a state, being recognised at a state level with an issue and then being recognised at a, in a national uh, level was a problem because um, it, the, they didn't, as far as we could see from our position, there seemed to be very little communication between the two about how the information from the state system was incorporated into the national system. Now, we can only comment on that from where we sit in a place like Fit for a Crossing. We obviously don't see or hear about the swap of information um, and how that transition from one to the other. But from my personal point of view, and I had sort of uh, uh, the handle on, on a lot of what how Tristan was being handled in relation to his FASD and other issues, there was very poor communication with us in relation to how it transitioned from one to the other. Did that poor communication include an aspect that he would have to be reassessed as to that condition for NDIS purposes, even though there'd been a, a diagnosis made by the and recognised by the state. Can I make a comment on that? Um, just to verify what Jeff was saying. When you go through the system in relation to the education system, and as as a parent of uh, um, uh, Tristan, um, he had to uh, be assessed to get on. In those days, they used to call it the school plus. And in order for him to get assessed to be able to get a special needs um, assistant at school, which he was allocated a point um, a point nine position, where he had um, an EA position to um, help him, you know, through his schooling right through till he was in year um, year nine. When he went to year nine, that's where then they wanted to reassess his whole, um, you know, his cognitive level where he was and how he could be able to sit all the different um, testing that, um, you know, we tend to give to children. Um, he, he, uh, um, he could not um, sit the ulna, he could not sit the, the West, at the time before NAPLAN came, we had West Australian, um, the walna. He could not sit those of us because he was not able to be able to 
read and write um, and to be able to understand those questions. So when, um, and he took, because of the, his history from the time he went to um, uh, daycare right through till year 12, he took all of those stuff with him to the disability here in WA. But whether that trans, those information, the historical information of him as a young person, whether that went across to when NDIS um, uh, came across. The only information that I received as his nominee and his care was in a letter saying that there was a rollout of this, uh, of um, now that Tristan was getting put across to NDIS. Thank you. Jeff, I want to raise with you your role in Tristan's business. I don't need to promote Tristan's business any further because he's done it wonderfully himself in the video. But I understand from your statement that you adopted the role of a mentor and supporter. Can you describe to the Commission what you would describe as a mentor model in that situation? What do you do? Um, <coughs> the, the, we didn't want Tristan to be sitting when he, when he graduated from school uh, and let me say, I think he was the only kid who graduated out of that year. Out, out of out of Fitzroy Crossing in that year, that out of school. Um, we didn't want him sitting around doing nothing and being caught up in a lot of the issues that a lot of the kids in Fitzroy Crossing are caught up with. One of the things in school that we'd encourage him to do was to leave the classroom if things were getting too challenging and not to overturn desks and swear at teachers and all of those sort of things. And he did that. And he went out to the, the gardener's um, place at the school and he made friends with the local Indigenous gardener there who taught him to ride a, ride a, ride a knot. Um, the, in Year 12, um, <clears throat> the Clontar Foundation... Uh, encouraged us to make an application for Tristan for a, 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 a sponsorship thing out of, I think it was ANZ, and they go, he got a scholarship for 10000 And when they asked him what he would like to buy with the, or do with his 10000 he said he would like to purchase a, a ride on mower and a trailer and stuff and continue doing some of the gardening stuff that he was doing. So um, Tristan uh, has great difficulty in reading and writing and gets anxious quite often. Um, when faced with things that are not, um, you know, not easy to solve. And so I was at a situation where <clears throat> I was sort of coming to the end of my working uh, for other people's lives and could see that there was an opportunity to uh, support Tristan uh, sort of in the background and make him give him a feeling of ownership of his of what he was doing because I think one of the things in a previous um, video of Tristan when he was 12 one of the things he said oh, I just want to be normal uh, and for him to be normal um, we, he needed to be doing normal things so uh, basically I sort of sat in the background and have done all of the you know the bookings and um, do the financial management and he doesn't have a driver's licence so I became his driver to, to drive him and his uh, ride on mower around and then so it's, it's, it's sort of that whole as, as it evolved it, it, the best role for me was not to be the to own the business and to run it and do all of those things or be seen to be doing that, but was to allow Tristan to make those decisions himself about what he wanted to do. So I sort of had to learn as I went along about how to do that, and and it and it sort of over the over the years. And one of the things I will mention um, that dealing with Tristan and working with Tristan was also very good for my own mental health. Um, in this, I suffered from um, quite severe anxiety <clears throat> for a number of years leading up to this. And then working with Tristan has made my life a whole stack better as well. So I just like to add that in because it, it um, that, and playing that sort of mentor role with him meant that I had to sort of, and with FASD kids, you've sort of got to be their external brain to a certain extent to guess when they're going to get anxious and to make sure that things are in place to reduce their anxiety. 
And so that sort of mentor role grew. And so that's the best way, I think, to describe it. And uh, it's been going for about five years now. That gets challenging sometimes because Tristan, um, over the last little period, for instance, he has he's, he's wanted to work less. And so that real work ethic and things which he displayed in that video sometimes are challenged. And so Mum and I have got to sort of work in the background to encourage him to keep those views that he espoused on that video going. Um, and I'd just like to say to the, the rest of the panel there that the, 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 um, the thing that resonates most with me with the FASD stuff is every day is a new day for that kid. It, and, it, and sometimes every, it's not every day, sometimes every hour is a new hour for that kid. So you, he can be performing at a, at a, a quite a, a substantial level and, you know, doing the things you saw him and speaking like he did on that video. But if anxi something makes him very anxious it, within, you know, a, almost immediately, can, it can all turn to something not quite so good. So... Um, the the idea of being a mentor for the kid is or for the person has grown you know what I mean it's 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 more than a mentor but that's the best way to describe it and I think it's the best way for the kid I want to explore that with you Jeff because I know from your statement you're concerned with what would happen to Tristan and his business when you're gone to put it bluntly. Um, I guess um, the in relation to that, we thought really hard about that. And, um, you know, um, I, my older daughter, who's, um, who lives um, in near Geraldton, who is actually a deputy CEO, um, who's the sister of um, um, Tristan, actually she said she's going to become the guardian of um, Tristan. So I guess we... You know, and and where we live, and I guess um, you know that's something that both um, Jeff and I um, thought about. Not only that, also my my do two grandchildren, because we, you know, we live here in this environment, and I know the um, you know the ability of my own um, my own family. Tristan's um, mum would not be able to look after Tristan in such a way, and and. I know that um, you know living in in this environment and the community. I think they will, you know, exploit um, our son because he is he is our son. We raised him, and um, yeah, it's very <laughs> very emotional for me to talk about. Um, <laughs> sorry. That's um, okay. It's all right. Like you <laughs> you you take as much time as you need. So I'll, I'll just while did, Jeff, be before you go on, hmm. I particularly wanted to get you to focus on what you say in your statement about a mentor model. For example, at paragraph 32, you say that if there were 20 supervisors or mentors, mentors, they could probably each reach five young people and suddenly you would have 100 people in that community that would have mentoring relationships. Can you explain your thinking behind that to the commissioners? Yeah, the the I guess what evolved with my working with Tristan, um, the, it became a model that was working very well for Tristan. In and as I say the, the the I had to learn a set of behaviours that that uh, enabled him to sort of feel that he owned where he was going. But the also going parallel to that, there was what was going on with the other two grandchildren, our 16 and 18 year old grandchild children we were looking for, looking after, and also Tristan's younger brother, Sebastian, who was um, who's now 22, I think. No, just turned 20. 20. Uh, because we gain more work, we had to have more people do stuff. And so we asked our grandchildren and these others if they wanted to come along and be involved in it. Now, I asked Tristan, would he be happy to have these kids, and it started with Sebastian, really, because Sebastian was getting into major problems with the law here in Fitzroy. 
whether and they asked us if we would give him a job this is they being the justice department and i asked tristan if he was happy for sebastian to work with him to, to keep him out of jail basically because he, when he turned 18 he wasn't was no longer a juvenile offender he was going to go to the big house uh, and that would have made him very vulnerable. Anyway, Tristan said yes, and so we got Sebastian working for us on different jobs. And Tylan and Quayton were not going to school. They disengaged from school quite significantly, and they then, we said to them, well, you can't just sit around home doing nothing. You need to earn yourself some money or you need to do something. And so they said, oh, can we join in? And they asked Tristan, and so... With one of them, he engaged quite significantly. The other engaged less significantly. But we had a team of four or five young men who were all troubled, all um, with issues, who were doing a really good job, in, as like Tristan said on that video, and you saw some of them on that video, and they, they, he viewed them as his gang. And so it... And so I was, and the role I was playing sort of in the background in organising the, you know, the places for them to go and doing a bit of quality control. And then, you know, if the mail broke down and Tristan wanted to turn it upside down or burn it, then I'd jump in and make sure that it didn't happen and, you know, those sort of things. And we would, I can remember one day we were all driving along in the car and they were all singing along to one of the locals. And I thought, this, this is really good. And it was because I was driving and they were all just sitting in there. And we had all the mowers on the back and the trailer and whatever. We were coming back from a job and everybody was sort of happy and talking together, which was really quite different to a lot of the situation. A lot of the other kids around the place who were the same age were experiencing. And I also chair the men's shed in Fitzroy, Gramiani, the local men's shed in Fitzroy Crossing. And we've been talking about a mentor model for... Uh, these troubled kids that are, uh, there's a lot of kids in Fitzroy who have been getting in trouble over the last couple of years, that the same sort of model that was evolving with, with, with me and my family was something we could possibly parallel with other families or other, situa other situations where you have somebody who has an understanding of the issues that these kids have and has the patience and the knowledge and the understanding and the resources to be able to live with that and to sort of mould that and have the kids engage in an effective way rather than in a disaffected way. One of the and things you raised, Jeff, if I could just interrupt, because I'm very conscious that we have limited time and there are some very significant issues I want to raise with you, is you say in your statement at paragraph 40, the NDIA should invest in training families and community and skilling them up. You go on to say, no use putting funding into individual plans where there is no infrastructure or services. If there is a bucket of money for Fitzroy Crossing, it should go to building infrastructure and supporting training families to care for people with disability. So moving outside Tristan's particular circumstances, are you suggesting to the Commission that what you and Marmaji created with Tristan could be applied to a lot of other families in your area? with sufficient training and support. If those families, and if there are identified people in those families that, that are able to provide the level of knowledge and support that's required, otherwise it can get exploited. But the, yeah, the, for, in Fitzroy Crossing, for instance, a good example is that we, there could be, there could, we could create little work parties, if you like to call it that. Um, but A, we need to create the things that the kids like doing. And B, we need to have, the skilled up people to be the mentors who understand the complexities of what they're dealing with and to be able to work with those groups to keep them together. And the challenges that we're having with Tristan right now in, in holding that group together and working with them is an example of that. Can I summarise what I think you're saying and tell me if this is correct? That if the funding under the scheme was more flexible and could be used by individual participants and their families in a way that best suited them on the one hand. And on the other hand, if there was protections to prevent exploitation of participants and misuse of their funding, that would be a model that you would urge the commissioners to consider? Absolutely. And Mamaji, do you have any views about that? 
Yeah, I, I you know, this is what I didn't um, bring out very well is that um, any scheme, you know, whether it's uh, in the IS and that there needs to be a screening to be able to put in place and, and perspectively, you know, really, um, you know, really look at how it can work in such a community like um, ours. You know, there was not enough information, not enough, not enough um, um, training of people. Because I guess uh, both of us, um, when we took Tristan on, we both, you know, we're both teachers and, and knew the model of care and knowing and understanding, uh, you know, about the behaviours of um, children like Tristan or any other children who have got a disability, those sort of screening needs to be put in place um, in, in, a, in a community such as ours, where our community um, is a low socioeconomic community, where money is so important to, and the value of money is important to the, um, our family. And it, it, it's really based around that, how can, you know, we can best manage a program that is rolled out um, to our community. And that's just, um, just from our experience of what we've seen of the, of that scheme being rolled out here. And your experience, Mamaji, has been, uh, I understand from your statement, that Tristan's allocation in his plans, which commissioners appears at hearing bundle C, tab 27, has not been utilised because the services are simply not available. Uh, that's one of the major reasons why those funds haven't been used. Is that correct? I guess um, what um, Jeffrey was trying to allude to the fact is that because, um, you know, the relationship that we had with Tristan as he's, he's being our son, we, um, Jeff was his mentor and all of those stuff. It's basically like his carer uh, to be able to look after and, um, and Tristan. And I guess that's, that's the flexibility we're saying, um, you know, that the commission really need to, um, really look at that particular scheme and who can access that. Because at the moment we could not access Tristan's um, um, a funding for him to even to obtain, you know, his license that he really, really wants to get and all of the other supports that was um, uh, in, in, his, um, in his plan. So it's all of those um, stuff that really um, he, he could not access because of the community that we live in and because of, um, you know, there was not enough staff around here to be able to, um, to deal with um, Tristan and other pe um, um, people like um, you who were on the plan in our community. And do I take it from both of you that it would suit your situation much better if the plans were flexible as to how the funds could be spent? The, the answer to that is yes. Um, but also, I think, and then the perspective from the men's shed, for instance, is that, and as Mumaji was saying, the um, there needs to be there needs to be a, a, a way to oversee how resources are allocated and spent, and so there needs to be a structure in place behind the individual families to support. Uh, the bigger picture, if you if you get what I mean, that, that if you're going to have say four or five of these uh, Tristan garden maintenance type operations happening in four or five different family groups or situations, there needs to be the infrastructure behind that to support it. So if th something goes wrong, how do you, how do you how do you deal with it? Because if you leave it up to the individual families, quite often it's too difficult. So you almost need supporting organisations behind it to to oversee it and monitor it, like Mumaji was saying, so it's not rorted in one sense, but is supported and, and, and it goes on because part of the issue with the families, and, and, and I see it myself, if I get sick, who takes over from me? And, and the answer is most probably nobody. And that really worries me because there is no other invested group to say, Tristan and the people that he's working in his little group, and they're all FASD type kids, they're all kids with special needs. What happens to them once the mentor or the person who is attached to them isn't available? So, Jeff, are we saying that we need to build infrastructure and capacity within those communities like your own? 
Absolutely, Fitzroy, and there's and I imagine Halls Creek and a lot of these remote places that are in exactly the same boat. And if you go out to the remote communities, they're most probably even worse. If you go to Yakanara or Wonkajonka or Nukumba, we've got some services here in Fitzroy Crossing, but those remote communities have nothing. And so, you know, the, the fly in, fly out, drive in, drive out type service delivery model that's being promoted, and you have service delivery coming from Perth. One of the reasons Tristan couldn't get his license because the the neurosurgeon that he had to get to sign off for him to be able to get his to sit the test for his license was in Perth. It was going to cost us five and a half thousand bucks to get him down there to see him, and then we couldn't get an appointment with him because it, it wasn't seen to be a priority. Uh, and the neurosurgeon never comes to the Kimberley. So we waited two and a half years to try and get Tristan his license, which is key to his mental health and how he sees himself because he wants to own his own business. He doesn't want his, his old father driving him around the whole time. He, he has, still has, to this day, still does not have his licence. And so a young man running a successful business <laughs> wants to have greater flexibility in his business and control by getting a licence, and it's been over two and a half years to try and go through the process of the assessments necessary to give him a realistic chance of achieving that goal. That's correct. Mamaji and Jeff, there are many other questions I could in an ideal world ask you now, but because of the time, I'm going to invite the commissioners to ask you any questions they wish. Thank you very much for your evidence. I will ask Commissioner Mason first if she has any questions she would like to put to you. Hi. <clears throat> Mum, G and Jeff, I just want to say thank you for uh, giving evidence today. Um, it's been really incredibly important to hear um, about the journey your family has gone on in that remote community. Um, but also his story is one of uh, empowerment and uh, but the system uh, sitting there in terms of the NDIS and, and previous disability services um, are there for the benefit of um, people like Tristan and others there in the community, but uh, the gap is still there in terms of getting the benefit to the individual. So it's been really valuable to hear evidence today and I wanna say um, thank you um, very much. Thank you. Can I add just something there? Uh, one of the, the, I support the whole NDIS concept in that it's adding a whole bunch of resources that were never there in the first place. But unfortunately, it seems to me that the NDIS is actually trying to fulfil gaps that exist in the broader system. And so things like lack of housing, you know, lack of uh, mental health practitioners, lack of uh, social workers in places like this, the NDIS is actually being seen to try and replace that. And it doesn't, it's not equipped to do that. So the services that we would normally get from state or federal agencies that are, are supposed to be doing these things, the, the model that, the delivery model that exists in state and federal governments means that places like Fitzroy Crossing are always going to miss out. And the NDIS is now being seen to be the stopgap for that. And it can't be because it just doesn't have the resources to fill in those gaps. Thank you. I'll ask now Commissioner McEwen. He has a question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Marmin G and Jeff. I too, following Commis Commissioner Mason's comment, thank you. I have one question. You've both talked a bit about support and the importance of keeping children with their families. And you've talked about some very, the various parts of support that you have had and would have liked. What in particular would early intervention support look like? So when the children are very young, what would be early intervention like from um, birth to maybe five to seven? What, what could that look like? That's, uh, uh, I guess, just from our own experience, I mean, the, the early intervention that we put in place for Tristan, I think, was a, a good model, even though um, 
it, it you know uh, it it was a family model and the support that we had around and one of the things that I when I went across to Canada this is something that um, our organization money and actually saw that particular model of care which we in and in Australia hasn't put in place um, um, as yet and, and I guess if if you look around that particular model of care and you know the philosophy behind that would be a fantastic model to use here in in our country in regards to children being taken away placed in homes and all of those so that intervention stuff and I guess it's also about when um, you know the intergenerational trauma that Aboriginal people have faced throughout their lives, which is really uh, the the cause of all the, the stuff that is happening now. So I guess, you know, just from my own experience, you know, when my younger, uh, my younger sister, who on medical condition was um, diagnosed with mental retardation, got taken to to Perton Training Centre at the age of eight years of age. My mother couldn't understand the reason why um, she got taken away and had to live in that. And also uh, Tristan's mum at the age of um, um, eight years old got, um, was diagnosed with leprosy and was, was placed at leprosarium at the age of eight. So knowing and understanding and having, you know, the empathy of um, what happened to my own family and my own experience by placing, you know, my two sisters in 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 the medical facilities um, because of that. And, and no doubt, just like all of the other policies that were put out you know, for um, Aboriginal people and Aboriginal families, I think we need to really look at um, uh, look at all the stuff that is being placed around it and what the intervention is going to look like. Can, can I say the at the at Garami Yanyu, we've been exploring <clears throat> how to become better uh, husbands, better uncles, auntie, uh, uh, grandfathers, better brothers, better family members. Um, and to uh, it seems to me that we need to have um, to build capacity amongst that group of men who quite often are damaged themselves to become those better family members to look after these younger ones. And you so say if there's a kid, if there is a kid born into that situation, that the, the, the family themselves can actually be supported with these other support programs for themselves. So if they've got alcohol or drug issues or they've got domestic violence issues or any of those or trauma issues, that we set up mechanisms to support those people do it themselves rather than try and transport the problem somewhere else. And just on that, um, we need to build the resources um, to be able, and that's one of the things that when the NDIS plan, it was just another, another um, in thing of, you know, I mean, we like the idea, the concept, it was another resource being placed in now in our community, but it wasn't done effectively the way it should have been. And the drive in drive out model uh, of service provision or fly in fly out or the last one zoom in zoom out uh, provision of service to families in remote communities is, is totally ineffective and has been proven to be totally ineffective forever. There are lots of organisations who get money to do some of this stuff that don't know how to connect in Fitzroy Crossing because they're based in Perth or Geraldton or somewhere else. And that discussion I had with the NDIS about Tristan's uh, new scheme, which happened in March, uh, the lady was speaking to me from Geraldton. Now, I, how she would have any idea of what it was like or what Tristan's need were her based in Geraldton and us based here, um, is, is problematic. Now, in the discussion with her, she was very compassionate when, and she said, yes, the th funding is under threat because you haven't used it. And she was understanding of that because obviously she was quite experienced, but she had no idea as to why that money wasn't spent. And, and then the threat of it being taken away is, is quite traumatic, really, in, in its consequences for Tristan down the track. Mm. Even uh, though we don't thank you both me. so much. Um, I'm conscious of time. Uh, thank you very much. Can I uh, just, Mamanji, ask you about this? In paragraph 45 of your statement, you say that when it came to Thailand and Quaden, 
you didn't bother to register them for the NDIS because you didn't want to put them through another assessment. Yeah, well... It, it, ideally, what sort of supports, without going into the details, what sort of support would you like to see Thailand and Quaden have if the NDIS was able to deliver support? I think it's what I was just saying, that the 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 parents quite the parents or carers are quite often overwhelmed by the, the problems that the kids display. And so, you know, the fact that Thailand Quaden um, left school, basically disengaged from school and wouldn't go to school, even though we Mumaji and I both Mum's a school teacher, and I support the school. We were un unable to get the kid to go to school. Now, the, to me, it gets it's building the capacity around the service deliverers to assist to plug these kids into. So it doesn't necessarily mean money for the kid, but it means money to support the 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 the, the issue. The, there's a bundle of these kids with these problems. So how do we help the school? engage better? How do we help Manan engage better with this group of kids? Um, just, you know, the question that you've asked me in relation to Thailand and Kuwait and the reasons why um, after experiencing with the Little One um, project, um, it's they had to go through a, re a rigorous um, assessment and I did not, um, you know, the way my two grandsons are, where their headspace is, to be able to put them through that rigorous um, assessment again to prove to anybody about, you know, of their own um, disability. So I guess, um, um, you know, I went out of my way um, to support my two grandchildren to their schooling when they're disengaged from um, at the school here, I um, got them finally into a school in Esperant, which, um, you know, on reports at the moment, um, we're getting um, very good report. But other than that, to get um, a study, what they call ab, ab study for them to attend, it took us two years or three years for for Thailand and Quayton to get on that particular scheme. So because of you know, um, our income or on my, based on my income. So I guess, um, you know, as a family, we manage and I managed um, to be able to, you know, try and get, um, you know, our, um, our grandchildren or children that we raised to the best, um, the opportunities like education for them. So we had to take them out of, you know, here down to a, a, another school somewhere where this school is, coping and doing quite well for um, um, the needs of our, our grandchildren. So I guess it's um, it's about, you know, any scheme, anything that we do, we need to really think thoroughly what it's going to look like in any setting that is being delivered to, you know, the remote remotes of um, West Australia. Thank you. Can I just ask a couple of questions about the uh, plan? The plan uh, provides for $107,000, as you said, for Tristan over a period of two years from May 2020 to May 2022. Am I right in thinking that the only part of that plan or the only monies that have been spent are the monies for support coordination? That's correct. And that goes to the NDIA, does it? Yes. Yep. What did they do for the eleven thousand um, dollars? They ring me up two or three times a year. That's it. That's it. We have requested uh, again. I think it's the system. The problem that the we we registered Tristan with Far North as the provider, and the reason we chose him because it was the only provider that was local. All the rest were either in Broome or Perth or somewhere else. And unfortunately, there's been so much pressure on Far North to deliver to the other kids with disabilities here. They, they just couldn't. They said to me straight out, we cannot deal with this licence stuff. It's too hard. Now, there's other things that Tristan most probably could benefit from if he was in Perth or Melbourne or Sydney or whatever, because there would be specialists at the doorstep or, you know, therapists of whatever or in whatever space. But in Fitzroy Crescent, there are none. And so basically it falls back to the capacity of the people who are looking after these kids to deliver it. Now, Tristan's quite fortunate in the fact that he's got Mamaji as a 
that his mother, who has such wide experience and also was able to give up her time. And then there's me, I was in the situation where I was able to retire from my, what I was doing to work to spend with Tristan. But the majority of the families here don't have any of that capacity. Yeah. The plan provided for $12,000 for uh, an improved uh, daily living funding, and that involves specialist driver training. So there was actually money specifically in the plan to enable yeah. Tristan to get his licence he still hasn't had his. He still hasn't got his license, and the problem and the reasons are the matters that you have described in your evidence. Is that is that correct? And there is no driver training in Fitzroy Crossing for him to access anyway. Okay. And especially kids with um, a disability, you know, trying to find the right uh, a model for any children um, or anybody who's got a disability to be able to obtain their license. That's the key factor to this. Um, in relation to um, Tristan update, obtaining his lesson um, license. Even to get his line, um, learners, he needs to sit in front of a computer to do his online training. So, you know, that, that um, you know, is a, a, a trauma for him to obtain his license. So, you know, that, that's the key factor, I think. And the... Plan also included thirty three thousand dollars for finding and keeping a job, and the monies were available for the school leave or employment services uh, to support Tristan and his move to access work. None of that money could be utilised in Fitzroy Crossing. No, because uh, there is there is no service like that, and so I feel that role. But because I'm his father, I can't. I can't, I can't, can't get paid. Yeah. yeah. Can't get paid. Well, I want to, to echo the thanks that have been given by Commissioner Mason and Commissioner McEwen uh, for the evidence you've given. If I may say so, it's very powerful evidence. I would like to see your evidence uh, become available and actually looked at and heard by as many Australians as possible. Um, you have provided uh, some uh, 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 accounts of matters that all Australians should be aware of and uh, that something has to be done about. So I thank you very much. Uh, I just want to check that there's no, we have represented parties and it's par for the course for me to ask if they have any questions. I assume nobody does, but I'll just check. Unless anybody leaps to their feet, I assume there are no questions. Thank you again. Very much, um, Jeff and Mamanji, for your evidence. We really do appreciate the help that you've provided to the uh, Commission. And, and Tristan was able to speak for himself, but also speaking on behalf of Tristan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Griffin, what do we do now? There has been a change in the schedule. The next witness will be Mudge, who was originally scheduled for after lunch. And do we take a break or do we have Mudge now? It's a matter for you, Chair. You tell me. I just work here. Uh, Evelina would like to continue. Sorry? We, we would like to continue. Yes, all we right. Could, that's, because that's, that's we're a little behind. Continue. Commissioners, our next witness is Mudge, Eric Bedford. He wanted to give evidence live today, but due to family commitments and sorry business, he's no longer available to give evidence. We will instead play a video statement that I recorded with Mudge on the 3rd of June 2022, where Mudge spoke about his experiences and those of his family. Operator, can you please play the recording, um, doc ID IND.0172.0003.0001. Yes, thank you. Thank you for joining me this morning. Um, your name is Eric Bedford. Yep. And you also go by the nickname Mudge. Uh, it's not a nickname, um, black hole name that got given to me when I was a child. And uh, over the years, over 30 years, it got cut down shorter and shorter. It's it's originally Majabiri, so yeah, down to Mudge now. And has that got special meaning for you, that name? Uh, yeah, it does. I gotta, that's, um, you got to carry our, carry our own people's name, you know, like the song lines and everything else that we got to carry through Australia. 
all those black fellas. And today we're going to have a talk about the experiences that you and your family have had with the NDIS. Yep. And the things that we're going to talk about today, are they going to be true and correct? Yep. Yeah. And you're living in Fitzroy Crossing, is that right? Yep. And you're a Bunaba man? Bunaba, yeah. A Bunaba man. Sorry. Yep. Um, and how far does Bunaba country go? Oh, uh, well, sort of expands, I'd say, over two, three hundred kilometres, you know, square kilometres and all that sort of thing. But I couldn't tell, tell you exactly, but yeah, I'd say about that. And are there different language groups within that country? Well, in Federal Crossing, there's five different language groups, but then there's, over the years, also picked up all the other languages along the way. But five are mainly in Petrol Crossing. And can you tell me what those five different ones are? Oh, you got Bunawa, Warmijeri, Nigana, Wangajunga, Guniandi. Um, yeah, that's five. Eh? And um, your family, you've got family ties through the valley? Yeah, my grandmother's Fitzroy Crossing. Um, grandfather, Hort Creek. So that's sort of through the Kim, um, valley. And then my mum's side of the family from Broome. So I'm sort of not only the valley through the Kimberley, I think. So from one end to the other? Uh, yeah, uh, half of my kids, uh, my kids, they are like from half of WA, I say, from the Kimberley down to the Pilbara, so. <laughs> and you're a dad of seven kids? Yeah. And at the moment, you've got four in your care? Yep, four in my care. One, one's in boarding school at the moment. She, this is her first year down there. So. And um, are you able to tell us, for those four that are living with you at the moment, what are their ages? Uh, the oldest is 13, 10, 8, and 6. And you've also got other family that living with you as well? Uh, yeah, I also have family that comes in and breezes in and out, and they always welcome and admire us, you know, what it's like with family. So, yeah, they come in there occasionally, and then sometimes they overstay their stay, but I don't mind it, you know. It's, Good to have family around. Yeah, and um, it's really important to have those family ties for everybody, isn't that right? Yeah, my kids have to know who they family are, and like we all got taught, you know, you got to know who your family are and connections and values and all that sort of stuff. And so, of the four kids at at home now at the moment, two of your children. Um, have a diagnosed disability? Yep. And um, you've got big responsibility for your family as well as, as part of culture, and that includes other family members who might have a disability. Yeah, it's, um, well, I think they all, I'm the sort of one who's taking it in and trying to help people. So all the other family been sort of, navigate or uh, gravitating towards me because I'm sort of getting an idea and stuff of how everything works with it and you know just trying my hardest to understand my son but then also have other family members as well with whatever I can. And that's because in community um, Aboriginal people don't see disability the same way that the Western community does. Yeah that's exactly right we just we see the um, strengths that they have. We don't see the, they just, um, you know, it, uh, I don't know how to explain it because we just see another kid, you know, and then nothing different to us is that kid might be a little bit different, but then we just work around the kids specialist charge, you know, like see they specialize in something, we'll just let them, you know, encourage them along to keep going with it and or 
support them in a way, the stuff that they like and um, yeah, make them feel like a normal child, you know? Because you just see the person. Yeah, we don't see the disability, we just see a person, another person. Mm -hmm. um, and today I wanted to talk to you about your son, Bubble Boy, and who lives uh, with you. Um, can you tell me a little bit about him, the sort of things that he likes to do and how old he is? Oh, well, he's, um, he's a 10 year old now, but he's a pretty big boy. And the things he loves to do is, uh, uh, loves the iPad, which is unfortunate, but I guess it's something to keep him calm. But then he also loves being outdoors and being in the river, especially in that water, you don't, he loves that water. I don't know that that water, him and the water have their own special connection. He, he won't leave the water, the water won't leave him. <laughs> yeah, he, he loves to be out in country and like most of the time, that's the only way I can get him off his iPad because it's gonna go flat out there and eventually he'll wander off and start doing some other stuff. And you take um, the kids and family and, and other community members out bush with you? Yeah, all the time, every, nearly every day, I'll take the kids down the river and 10 other kids will jump on while I'm making my way to the river, you know? Or then someone else, you always bubbling into family members down at the river anyway, so. Yeah, I'll try and tire them out down there. And my boy loves it. He loves going to the river every day. Um, so the Matawara has a very important role for uh, Burumba people and other people in the valley? Yeah, yeah, that um, that's, it plays a big role, I think, in our, you know, that's our, I don't know, that's our, that's our food source, you know, that's our, we drink out of the water, our river and, um, you know, that's like a supermarket, we got everything in there, you know, that's like a mental health stop, uh, mental health service. Uh, you know, we got, yeah, you know, the field going out on country, you just, all the worries off you. No, no more stress thinking about stuff, you know. So that river is really um, a way for um, people connected to it to be healthy and have well-being yeah um yeah healthy well-being is i think there's a whole lot of benefits of having to live on alongside of that wonderful river over there. now i just want to talk about um a bubble boy and, and how you came to learn about the ndis um so uh, when were you told that Bubba Boy um, had a disability or, or he got a diagnosis? When he was about uh, three years old. He, yeah, he got diagnosed at three. And do you remember who told you? Uh, it was a kid doctor quite a while ago now. And did they come into community or do you have to go out to get that information? Um, well, they sort of let us know over the phone, I think, because we had to go for an appointment and they had to do all these assessments and stuff. And then we had to go home and then learn over a phone call. And um, you explained a bit before about some of the things Bubba Boy likes. But uh, could you tell me what are the best things about Bubba Boy? Uh, there's a lot of a lot of good things about that boy. And I think the best thing is he, my son. <laughs> and um, yeah, he got dog got in me, you know, and he keep me going. I think that some of the best things about him is you get your cuddles and stuff off him now and then. And you rarely get them, so that when they do come, you. Oh, they one of the best moments you get with him. Yeah, so make you feel real proud, hey? Yeah, yeah. Feel, you know, like that's like another booster for me to 
keep going again, you know, with him. Yeah, yeah. Keep trying. And um, how did you come to know about the NDIS? <coughs> I think um, working at uh, Women's Resource at a mine in Wantagura, I, um, well, they sort of seen me as a, I could be a good um, worker to, to work with this disability stuff. And I sort of took, took the opportunity to learn more for Bubway and then along the way, NDIS, I found out about NDIS and with my colleague here, um, Lauren and Sue, everybody advocating for me. I think, um, yeah, I think it's just, I think NDIS found me because I was a single dad and didn't know where to go or look, you know, where to get help. But then that job come up and I thought that was a good opportunity. And then I think the word got out there and everyone wanted to help. So yeah, and just took, taking all the help I can get now. Yeah. And so um, you learned through your job and, and through people also helping you at Manan. Um, when did you actually um, sit down and put an application in there for Bubble Boy? Uh, 2020. So only two years now. And was that in person or on the phone or on the internet? How did that happen? Um, I think that happened over the I think on, in person, the, uh, I've seen, I think one of their little, they just come down in, in, to Vitro first time I've seen one of them, NDIS mom. Okay. Yeah. And was it good to have someone there in person to talk to? Well, yeah, because then they don't just hang up or don't, can't just put you on mute or whatever, you know? So that's why I prefer always to talk in person and yeah. And that's not just something um, that you would prefer, but a lot of people in community, um, it's easier for them to sit down face to face to talk to someone, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's, I think that's in any sort of conversation, I think when that's every you know, people, you got to go and talk to the person, you know, not, you don't know who you're talking to on the other end of that phone, especially with the old people and stuff, you know, mm. who they talking to. And um, for yourself, um, did you think, that you needed any interpreter or do you think community might need interpreters to sit down and, and have those yarns? Yeah, I think that there's a there's a whole misunderstanding with the, for me, I can un, sort of understand both ways, but for my people, you know, it's, it'll be really, really hard for them because I can, I can understand the, most of the Western ways, but NDIS, I don't know. Yeah, and so that person come and were they from Fitzroy Crossing? Were they from Broome? Do you know where that person came from? Uh, Derby, they just come from Derby. Okay. I think he was the head of the Kimberleys, I think, but their office was based in Derby. And how far is Derby from Fitzroy Crossing? 288 kilometres to be exact. So <laughs> if you was driving, how long did, would that take you? Um, probably two and a half hours, three. So that's a long way to go, um, especially if someone doesn't have a car. Well, even if I did have a car, I'd probably, it'd probably still take like at least more than three hours with Bowboy and his siblings in the car. I'd have to pull over. Kick the footy around with the my son with eighty eighty burn him out a bit and then also got Bobo wanting to get to the next Wi-Fi destination so yeah it's not a it's not a usual uh, it's not just a trip down the road for me it's a bit of a hands-on vacation sort of thing <laughs> yeah so even more important for uh, there to be some one in person there in Fitzroy Crossing from the NDIS to talk about those things. Yep. Um, and now after 
initially signing Bubba Boy up for the NDIS, how do you keep in touch with the NDIS? Oh, well, I, because I'm so busy with work and all that other sort of stuff, I, one of my work colleagues is dedicated to personal time for just to help me with all that sort of stuff because I'm not a very bright person with a phone or a computer or anything like that. So, yeah, I've got a very, very good work colleague that helps me with all that stuff. Yeah, and and so if, if you didn't have that help, would you have to email and phone someone? Um, if I didn't have help, I'd probably, to tell you the truth, I'd probably give up because I'd, you know, like, I wouldn't know where to go, what to do, you know? And I just been living with Bow Boy just day by day, you know? And I just thought that when I was heard something bad, you know, try something, uh, you want something new, you gotta try something new. And I wanted something new for Bow Boy and thought I'd try this NDIS stuff, but I think I'm still working. <laughs> try it. Yeah, yeah. And um, do you think many other people in the valley might feel the same way if they didn't have that help that you, you get from your colleagues? I think most of the people that are on NDIS in the valley are already give up, uh, given up on them because I would have, I reckon. And do you think the NDIS understands um, what it, the way of life for people in, in the Kimberley? No. What sort of things do you think they don't understand? Well, for a start, they never even been to Fitzroy. They never spent a day there. And I heard something again, if you don't wake up there, you know, if you don't go to sleep there and don't wake up there, well, you don't know. And so is that, is that difficult um, for someone who doesn't live in community um, to be able to connect um, from a long way away uh, if they've never been there and, and don't know the way of life? Yep. That's just like you take me down to Perth and drop me off and tell me to go to Centrelink when I already know where the Centrelink is in Fitzroy. You know, take someone else and just get them lost. Yeah. And and do you think that um, that's another reason why um, people might not want to um, work with the NDIS or ask for help when they might need it? Well, when you ask for help, you want the person to be standing there in front of you and you don't what you gotta wait a two weeks when you ask for after you ask for help, you're gonna give up after two weeks. They still not there. NDI is still never came. You know what I mean? So before you said that Bubble Boy has a package for um and he's been signed up on the NDIS for two years. Um, you know how much is in his package? Um I think about sixty thousand. And did someone explain to you um, how to use the package or access that information, like on a portal or anything? Um, no. So you had to learn those things through yourself and asking other people for help? Well, through my, self, uh, my work colleague and me, like she's, she's a really good person. She'll dig into stuff and she'll actually find us, you know? So I just want to ask some questions around the support services. So before you were just saying, you know, they got to come into Fitzroy Crossing from different places. And how much time do they generally spend with him? Like one hour or something, I'd say. Drive eight, drive eight hours to do one hour a month. I think the, the um, I think the trip costs more than the session. I think therapy session. How do you feel about that? 
Well, it's not fair that my son lives in Fitzroy and you got another kid in Perth that, you know, can just go around the corner and, well, it's a bit unfair, I reckon. So if you had to leave Fitzroy Crossing to go and get those services just around the corner, like you say, in Perth, that it's easy access, what would it mean to be off country? Well, I think it'd be it'd be hard, unfamiliar country, unfamiliar surroundings, and you know, gotta adapt, unfamiliar weather, all that sort of stuff. You know, it'll be like I don't know. You can't just walk into the navy yard and stuff like that. It won't be the same. And would you have family if you had to move to somewhere like Perth just to access services? Well, the only time I have family is probably when they do come down for services anyway to Perth. So, yeah, I probably would, but then it would be like, oh, they stay at my house for, they come down for looking for services probably too, you know, or something. Something that we don't have in the Kimby, you know. But it's not like what you have now where families are around you all the time. You can go bush whenever you want to. Well, yeah, you know, like family member now, family member, you drive past the front of my house, the kids jump on, they go into the river, you know. I just get a message on my phone, I got the kids at the river, you know. And Perth, what if someone, what if someone do that down in Perth? My kids used to just, seeing a car drive by with people they know, they just jump on. What if that happened in Perth? That's a kidnap. I lose my kid. Mm. And, you know? and is that also, when you're living there in Fitzroy, being on country, um, everyone looks after everybody? Well, even the country look after us. You know that, you know? Even the old people, they might be gone, but they still looking after us, you know? They still get an eye on the kids. And yeah. So you don't have that feeling if you have to move off country. You don't have that support and that community that everyone look after everyone and the old people and country looks after everybody as well. Yeah, well then like going to another country, that country probably don't know me, you know how we feel. They probably won't look after me, you know, and stuff like that. Mm. And well, back up here, you know, people can, you can see the people looking at your kids. We go to the city, people looking through windows, looking at you, know, looking at you and stuff like that. You don't know what watching you in the city. And it's a long way. Fitzroy Crossing is a long way from Perth, isn't it? Yep. So it's not like it's down the road. Well, it, I'm, I'm going to feel totally unsafe because I only got two hands and I got four kids. How am I going to hold on to all of them in Perth? I'm no bubble and I'm going to hang on to my leg and walk down the street. <laughs> um, and because we were talking earlier about, um, you know, family breeze in now and again into um, your home or just into community that might be travelling through. So you have responsibility in community as well, which is why you, it's, you have to really be connected to that. And it would be hard if you had to move off country for family. Well, um, yeah, uh, it is, it, it would be hard and then it also would be hard on my younger brothers and, you know, like all, I'm um, one of the oldest friends of my grandmother and she's a stolen generation, but she, we trying to keep all, whatever she still has the knowledge that she still has, we try to keep it going. And that's one, one of my, I think she put me in charge of all that stuff. I gotta teach my other brothers and, you know, I think it's like, if my little brother step out of line, you know, in culture, it's like if your little sister step out of line, well then as a big sister, you'll feel that we weren't doing something right. You know, we didn't teach him right. So I also got that. I'm trying to teach my younger brothers, kids also, you know, teach, teach them the, 
what I know about the Western world and all that sort of stuff too. And it's like a big, it's a yeah, really big thing on me. And um, yeah, it's I'm a, so I'm sort of yeah, I'm sort of that's why I'm a busy man, I think. <laughs> and so you wouldn't be able to do that if you had to move out of community and you know, like I was saying, to Perth, for example. Well, for example, if I say that if I got to move to Perth and one of my little brothers get into trouble or something, if I phone them up on a phone call, they can just hang their phone up on me. If I'm in person, you can't just hang your phone up on me then, you know? Yeah. And it's my job as a older brother to keep them in line. And if they do step out of line with their parents, that, that's when I got to, you know, that's part of my job as in the in the uh, uh, kinship system and cultural system, you know, and everybody got a role, you know, and if I reckon it's like the ecosystem, you move the crocodile, you know, the ecosystem will start going out of what you move the, you move the, the person that everyone listens to and stuff like that. You know, like my younger brother, they all listen to me. They all come to me advice. You remove him. What's going to happen to my little brothers? Mm. You know? And I want, for me, I really think that I got a um, good, I think that I'm a good person and I hope for some of my little brothers to turn out like me too. So then we do have more people out there, like, you know, yeah. start the ripple, start the ripple effect. And, and make that community strong. Yeah, well, 10 men, you know, worth more than one. So I'd rather empower 10 men than empower myself because, you know, I'd rather share my knowledge with 10 people than keep it all to myself. Then I, got, then I know that I, got, I, you know, I taught 10 good people and there's 10 more good people out there, you know. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, you've, you've had some help from your colleagues and, and Manan and how important is it for you to have that in your life? Well, that's really important because my son didn't help, you know, and the main thing I want is for him to be independent. And I think the more help that we can get for him is another step forward for him, you know, not about me, it's about him, I think. My, not only him, it's about all our people that when did we get help from NDIS? And Manan yeah. there understands culture and family? Yep. That's uh, culture and family is, I think, part of Manan. And, you know, it's a woman's resource and, and what starts a family, culture, women, the holders of the, you know, Yeah. And Manan understands um, how you need support, how Bubble Boy might need support so that you have the best life for you and your, your family. Yeah, I think, yeah, they, uh, Manan is all about family and, yeah, I think they're all about helping the whole valley of trying to, um, yeah, like teach everyone to look after their family and all that sort of stuff, you know. And I think Martin is doing a really good job. And um, it's a community organisation, so it's it's run by people from the Fitzroy for people in the Fitzroy. Yeah, well. Mine and it's run by CEO is the woman who grew, grew up in Fitra, grew up and you know, seeing all this stuff. She uh seen seeing me grow up and you know. And that's why that's one of the reasons why I trusted mine because they had people there that I knew and I'm familiar with, you know. 
it's like a yeah it's like you well you try to move me down to Perth and get me working with someone else you know it'll take that time again for me to earn that trust and you know like whether I can trust this person or not you know it's like a but because I know the bosses and everyone that works at mine and I I just felt uh, you know slipped right in there and I just felt like felt at home on the first day and that's important for you and 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 community to to have that well I think is yeah that's the most important thing to have connection with your community and your country family ties and all that sort of stuff you know cultural ties and you're gonna have connections every you know now I wanted to talk about respite have you been able to access respite for bubble boy uh that's another thing I'd rather the money go towards his therapy and stuff then you know like like I said earlier it's about him and like if I gotta if I don't have respite and he gets another therapy session then that'll be it you know because I'm not gonna go like use his money up for my stuff when he could have used that to you know have another therapy session and plus there's I don't think there's even enough money for that. So, yeah, it's complicated. Yeah, uh, but if you had to access respite, is there respite in Fitzroy Crossing? No, you got to come out of the room and that's another thing. That's, I don't, I wouldn't trust that. Leaving him with someone I don't even know, you know, that's, I won't, I won't have respite if that's, that won't even be respite. That's going to be a little holiday for Bubba, but more stress on his day. Because I don't trust that person that he's going to. I don't even know that person, you know. And I'm, my heart's higher than when he, you know. And respite meant to be to, I don't know, meant to give the parents a break or something, but that don't, that's not a break for me. I, I wouldn't call that respite, I'd call that admitting dad into mental health. <laughs> um, so do you think um, the Western understanding of respite is very different to what Aboriginal people might need for respite? I don't think they, I don't think they understand respite for us compared to respite for them, you know? So, so for you, what would it look like? Would it be going bush and being able to be supported to do things like that or what would it look like for you yeah like you know something that i could probably just go spend a few like a day at least a night out on the river on you know like just me and my girlfriend and you know just go out fishing be out on country that's the every time i get a break that's what i'm doing i'm hooking the boat up and i'm going out bush you know you won't see me for the until until I say I gotta get the kids back, or they say they're gonna bring the kids back, you know. So I'll um, people like all the people that I know help me look out of the boy, like my sisters, and that's you know like, and that's another thing. I'll only let them. I'll only let Bowboy go to certain people that I know I feel comfortable with. I have to like something inside me has to calm to let Bowboy go, you know, like I have to get that, earn that trust from that person that pass my knowledge on to know that that person knows what Bowboy is on about, you know, like, yeah, it's, I don't know, I gotta, I have to feel good inside to have respite, like with people I trust and I know that will look out for my son. If I'm gonna send him to a room, that's not, yeah, I wouldn't, um, that's not respite. I'd probably just go and check in around the corner and just keep an eye out, you know, that's how, that's how bad I'd be with him. Like if he with my sisters, I can, you know, like I can go out fishing and uh, switch my phone on. So sort of whereas if I got to send him to the room, I'm not going to switch my phone. On. I'm going somewhere where I got to have reception. So if something does happen, 
But then, whereas if he's with my sister, if something does happen, he's still in good hands, you know? So, yeah, respite, I don't know. I don't know what they call respite. Mm. And, and do you think I, that... They should, call, they should call it respite. Bite me in the wrist every time. And, <laughs> <laughs> and um, do you think that the NDIS needs to understand the, the role of family and end of that connected community in looking after one another? We were talking about it just before. Um, but in, in the context of respite and support, the difference of having people from outside come in. Do you think they understand that difference? No, nah, they don't understand it. Because, yeah, I don't know. I don't, if you ask an NDIS person, if we get that feeling that I just explained to you, but, you know, then they might understand, but I don't know if they do understand that. The point is for them to be to give the parent a break, a break it more, you know? Mm. So do you think the NDIS actually understands uh, Aboriginal people, whether it's um, whatever they people? Understand. They don't understand us at all. Like, they don't understand uh, kinship, culture, you know, everything. They don't, they just, I don't know, they don't, yeah. Nothing, and they don't. They don't, they don't, yeah, they don't understand the life we live in, you know. If we switch lives, I think they might, but, yeah. I don't think anyone would want to look out of Bow and Tootie. <laughs> <laughs> and from your experience, uh, have you worked with any NDIS people that are Aboriginal? Every other race, but not Aboriginal. Sorry to say that, but, you know, it's true. Do you Maybe. think it'd make a difference if they had Aboriginal people where they're working? Well, if they hire me and you, it would change everything, right? Yeah, you know? I reckon so. <laughs> it, would change, it would change the whole structure of everything. <laughs> Do you think they understand that in Aboriginal culture, we also have men's and women's business and, and why that's important to our people? No, they don't understand that. They, um, they think we all under the same thing as them, you know. Um, yeah, this. They wonder why us Aboriginal people, most incarcerated people in the world, because we gotta look out, look after. You know, we gotta live with the Western cultural ways rules. And then our rules, you know? Yeah. They don't understand it, you know? And what do you think they need to do to be right way for Aboriginal people and your family? Well, like I said before, you know, never too late to start listening, eh? Sit down, come, come, come sit down with us, live with us in the community, you know? Come and, you know, like, come and sit on the grass and have a cup of tea with us, you know? Instead of me going to your office and getting lost 10 times before I find the door and, you know? Come and, yeah. Actually, come and sit down and listen to us, you know? So what message do you have for other Aboriginal people who might be experiencing the same things that you and your family have had to deal with? What message would you have for them? Well, my people keep fighting, you know? Don't stop, don't... Like, the, you know, never give up, don't give up just... We're to keep fighting for our kids, next generation, and hopefully we'll be the people to change it for our next generation. And you know, I just keep, I just got to keep fighting until you.
I get somewhere. Mm-hmm. Maybe keep talking, keep 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 talking too. So they then they they hearing us, but we gotta make them start listening. You know, they can hear that noise in the background, but then until they hear what that noise is, you know. Mm. I reckon us as Aboriginal people, yeah, we'll keep should keep fighting and try and make it better for our people and yeah. And what message would you have for government? Never do stay late to start listening. You know? Yeah, never too late to start listening. Maj, is there anything else that you wanted to say? Um, I think there's a lot of things I'd like to say, but um, I reckon that NDI should, um, as they say, the national disability insurance scheme, but well, we all national, you know, how come, how come we get treated different than someone down in the city, but it's a national disability scheme, you know? Should they change it to city? Because <laughs> that's, yeah. I gotta, I gotta pay for my own flight to go down to Perth to get therapy for Bobo, you know? But a person down in Perth would, you know? So, yeah. So they treat remote and very remote communities differently from the city communities. Yeah, but then they say they're national, you know? They say they cover all of Australia, but then you go under the rules of the city, you know? In the city, you got public transport and stuff. What we got up here? So, yeah. Oh, thank you, Mudge. Um, really appreciate you sharing your your experience in your life um, and Bubble Boy's experience in his life. Commissioners, Mudge also partook in a short interview about the Matwara Fitzroy River. Before we play that video, I'd like to acknowledge the Matwara Fitzroy River Council and Stephanie King for their efforts in producing the short film, uh, allowing the commissioners to show it today. Operator, could you please play doc ID MFRC dot nine 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 dot triple zero one dot triple zero one. You just feel free at the river. Nothing to worry about. I'll try and get down as much as I can. Me and the cousins will go out nearly every day after work on the boat and just even have dinner down at the river. Just to be at the river, I think. And you just take all the worries off your shoulders, you know, and it's a place to, I think, healing and, you know, just bring you back down to earth and not, not worrying about anything else in town and you just feel free at the river. The old people just teach us a lot, like you can cook fish in the paperback trees and some of the trees along the river, they like medicine. When a certain tree is flowering here, we know that the crocodiles are laying eggs and or about to hatch and that. We're in pretty bad drought now. I've never seen this river quite, well, you know, this low before in my life. Usually the water a bit back up there and used to be good all year round, you know. You do farming around here, I think, yeah, most of the chemicals end up in the river. If you're gonna get the big pumps and all, that's just taking more water. Oh, well, for my kids, like, I wanna see this, see them see this river how I used to see it, you know, and not polluted and all that, with all the farming and stuff. I reckon just leave our river alone, you know. It's home to most of us, and we used to walk this river up and down, but I think with the farming, they'll stop all that, you know. Stop our kids from going hunting along the river and fishing. One thing the old people used to tell us, you know, you look after the river, the river will look after you, and yeah, it will always 
So we always had that thing about looking after the river, you know. Got to look after the country, you know. Thank you. Morning tea break. Um, if we might adjourn until 12.20. Yes, all right. Thank you. Um, on behalf of the commissioners, I too would like to express our appreciation to Mudge for uh, speaking to Mr. Argo and giving us the benefit of his experiences and uh, his views about the operation of uh, the NDIS in uh, Fitzroy. We'll take an adjournment now until 12.20 uh, Central Time. The Royal Commission is now adjourned. Silence, please. The Royal Commission is now in session. Yes, Mr. Arga. Commissioners, we will now hear from Renita Giacomara and Topsy Giacomara, um, who will be appearing um, again from Fitzroy Crossing, and they've both been administered the oath prior. Um, I understand that our connection is just being joined. Uh, I'll just check, is Renita able to hear us? Yes. Uh, so Renita will be appearing off camera um, and we'll speak with Renita first before we hear from Topsy and um, her partner is there supporting her today. Thank you. So we will hear first from Renita, but both for Renita and Topsy, thank you for being prepared to come to the Royal Commission and uh, to give evidence. Uh, and uh, we have uh, had the benefit uh, of uh, the uh, statement uh, from uh, Topsy. I don't, uh, Ms. Tarago, do we have a statement? Uh... So in terms of Renita, um, and I'll get to that momentarily, there's a pre-recorded audio and there's oh, some right. other okay. aids. Okay. Thank um, you. And there is a statement that Topsy has Yes, uh, we, we have the statement from Topsy. So thank you, Topsy, for your statement. And thank you both very much for coming to the Royal Commission to give evidence. Just to explain uh, where everybody is, in case you're not aware, we are, of course, in the hearing room in Alice Springs. Uh, and on my left is Commissioner Mason. And on my right is Commissioner McEwen. We are the three commissioners who are responsible for the conduct of this particular hearing. And of course, Ms. Tarago is in the uh, Alice Springs hearing room with us. So, Ms. Tarago. Uh, Renita, you're a Yoruru woman? Yes. And you live in Fitzroy Crossing? Yes. And uh, you work on radio as a, an announcer? Yes. And you've been doing that role as a radio announcer for a long time now. Yes. And you're the longest serving staff member for Wonky Radio. Yes. Um, we've got a recording of some of the work that you've done, and it's an interview that you conducted with a community member about her grandson who lived with uh, a disability. Um, operator, can... We hear the recording doc ID IND.0168.0001.0001 What would you like to see change in Fitzroy? Good question. <laughs> Your grandson. Oh, for my grandson? Yeah. More support um, for him? Um, with his hearing problem and um, maybe 
better teacher in the school that um, understand um, Auslan and we need support in learning how to um, learn Auslan um, and we haven't got that here so people who with like NDIS wherever the support comes from they need to have a really good look at um, kids because it's not just my grandson there's he heaps of young kids that has um, disability with um, being deaf. Okay yeah is it hard for you to find it to use that NDIS? Um, sort of because we don't really know what the programs and what um, how it helps Aboriginal people but I'm sure there's an office in Marawara that deals or wherever, um, maybe Manin or Marawara or whoever running NDIS in this um, valley. They need to come and sit with families and really explain what is NDIS and what does it mean to the families and how it helps, how it helps the family to get services and to help our um, young people in this town who has a disability. I don't think so. Do, do you think we need um, to get another bus or another car support to take to pick up clients? Well, we've got a hack here, um, I don't know, far north. So all those services are there, but how do people um, get to them? How do they know what's the um, thing about how do you work with families from commu remote um, communities, every new community, and how do you and how do they um, let people know what do they do in this town? Okay, well, thank you, Selena. Renita, on the 29th of April this year, I came to see you in Fitzroy Crossing and we had a yarn about um, what's been happening for you. Do you remember that? Yes. Um, I'll ask the operator to play the recording of our conversation and that's doc ID ind Hey, Renita, we're here today. You're here with Avelina, and we've just been having a yarn about a hoist that would help you for the house. Can you tell me about what troubles you've been having with it? I'm waiting for things to come over the border. And, and um, there's one part just came last week and they opened it up and they tried to put it together but they found out there was a part missing. So does that mean now that there's a delay? Yeah. And you, how are you feeling about having to wait? I can't wait too long. It's stressful. Yeah. And what about your wheelchair? Have you been waiting for a new wheelchair too? Yeah. So long. Do you know how long? Years, months? Years. I think years. I don't know. I think it was years. And the wheelchair that you have at the moment I think you were just saying before, like it's nearly ready to go. Yeah. It's, yeah, it can't last long. Because what, what would that mean if you didn't have a wheelchair? Uh, would that be really difficult for you to get around? Yeah, I can't. Um, yeah, that is really... Yeah, it is true. And um, is there another hoist as well that you've been waiting for to maybe help you in and out of a car? 
Yeah. And you're waiting on that one too, hey? Yeah, it's still coming over from overseas. But I don't know. <laughs> You've been waiting months, years for that one? Two years. Two years. So it's a couple of three years. Three, yeah. So it's a long time that you've been waiting for a few things that's going to make your life a lot easier, hey? Yeah. So what other one? So Renita, we're just um, yeah. having a yarn about what transportation that there is and you've been a couple of different places in Broome and, and other places that have a lot of services but not so much here in the valley. So what yeah. sort of things do they have in Broome, for example, for, for transport? Like, they have... Um, like more wheelchair buses and more more things in and around that place like for supports in that place so yeah. to get around and access your supports and yeah. get around different places. Yeah. What about respite to go access respite? Um, that's pretty hard. Uh, well, for me, I had to find my own respite. Did you? And place, respite place. Where did you end up having to go for respite? Um, oats, broom. So that's a long way from the valley, hey? Yeah. How long is that drive between here and Broome? Um, 400. Kilometres? Yeah. So about four hours, long time, hey? Yeah. Yeah. So if, if you've got no transport in, in Fitzroy Crossing... You have to wait for someone to maybe come down from Broome to pick you up? Oh, my mum drives me over. Yeah. But she took me in a lower bit of a car where I can, like, put a little bit of support on my legs. Yeah. But normally is her car a bit bigger and that's why you need the hoist to help you in and out of it? And yeah, now it's high. Yeah, so it makes it hard, hey, without the hoist. Yeah. When was the last time you had respite? Did you say about a month ago? Renita, since we spoke in April... Are you still waiting on both the car and home hoist and a new wheelchair? Yes. And last week, did you have some problems with your wheelchair? Yes. Would you be able to tell the commissioners what happened? Um, my tyre came off. The, um, the big one. And did it take a little while for you to find, somehow find a, a solution to that? Yes, an hour. And, and did that affect you getting to work? Uh, I was there. Okay, what so it happened. Sorry? I was there already when it happened. Okay. It came off at the workplace. Now, the, the NDIS bosses will be listening today. Yeah. Is there anything that you would like to tell them about what's been troubling you? 
Yes. And what would you like to say? Um, waiting for this tire so long and happened to get a tire off my son's bike to put on here to help me get into the studio out of the toilet. <laughs> Yeah, I was in there one hour, stuck in the toilet. And so you really need to have your wheelchair replaced? Yes. The seat is about to rip on the one I'm using. And is there anything else at the moment that's troubling you? Um, um, getting around, around this town and Got these tires about to break. I'm trying to get two places. Thank you, Renita. Our commissioners, did you have any questions for Renita? Commissioner Mason. Oh, no, thank you, Chair. Commissioner McEwen. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Renita, for uh, your evidence uh, we very much appreciate that you were prepared uh, to uh, talk with Ms. Tarago and to provide the information that you have today to which we've listened very carefully. Thank you so much. Yes, Ms. Tarago. Thank you. Uh, we'll now have um, an opportunity to speak with Topsy, who you can see on screen. Topsy is Renita's mum and she's supported by her partner, Marty, today. I'll just check in if um, Renita needed any opportunity to um, have support or whether she would like to stay in the room as well. Yeah. Okay, excellent. And Topsy, you've all already taken an oath prior to this? Yes, I have. And you're Renita's mum? Yes, I'm Ronita's mum and carer. Um, so Ronita is my um, uh, oldest daughter. Um, uh, her biological father is deceased and um, my partner and I have six other adult children and 14 grandchildren as well. And three of those grandchildren are also Ronita's children? They are. I support Ronita um, with um, caring for them as well. Uh, th three of them, uh, all, they're all boys. Um, their ages are eight, nine and 10. They have a range of um, medical and mental health issues and they're all on medication as well. So um, a part of my daily routine is um, administrating medication to um, the boys and caring for Renita. And you also work as well? And I also work full time, yes. Yeah. Um, Topsy, prior to the NDIS, Renita had been receiving some support through the State Disability Services. Can you share with the commissioners what it was like in terms of supports back then? Before the NDIS, I found it um, much easier to get supports for Renita um, on the basis that they were based locally in Fitzroy. Central, central in town. They were based at the IGA um, where communities and people all come to do shopping. Um, it was like a meeting place. Um, so it was easy for people to just to pop in to the Disability Service Commission office and, and seek support from there. Um, so um, in the days that they were supporting us, they've um, used to do face-to-face -face, um, home visits, um, 
just to check on ch- check in on us um, and used to um, arrange uh, meetings with other families with disabilities, um, family members um, to get together and discuss issues. Um, and also they used to provide activities for um, people with their disabilities to keep them occupied. Um, and one other thing that um, that they did was um, advertise locally for support workers. Um, and that was um, just by putting notices up around notice boards around town where anyone could see um, um, that this family or certain families need support. So that was some of the things that I've sort of um, could say about disabilities. They've also um, supported us with um, extending our um, our home. So they've um, supported with building a bedroom with a toilet and shower specifically for Renita uh, and ramps at the front and back door so she can get outside and get around, um, around out and around the house. Um, we didn't have much trees then, so um, they are also extended our veranda so she had a bit of a place to go outside and sit um, when she was quite young. Um, so there was a lot more accessibility back then in terms of a community presence and a more sense of community in terms of people being able to come together to discuss um, issues in the disability community. Yeah, that's right. I, I think um, being based on the ground locally in town in Fitzroy where people can see the service, access the service was um, a big benefit for us having their presence. Mm-hmm. And what has been the most beneficial from that previous scheme? What was the most beneficial thing for Renita? That was um, um, being on the grounds, faster service, um, having that regular contact, face-to-face contact, um, just checking in was really um, supportive um, when they were, yeah, when they were around at that time. So just touching on the face-to-face contact, is it important to members of the Fitzroy Valley community to know who they're working with and establish a relationship with that person? I think it is important to maintain contact. Um, because because Aboriginal people um, they like to know um, that that person is always going to be there for them, um, not just a one one time visit and and they're gone. Um, they like to know who that person is. So if any issues come up, they can go back to that person or that place and seek support for their issues. And is that connected to? maybe experiences where um, there's issues of trust or accountability? I think both, yeah. And when was it that Renita first applied for the NDIS? I believe that she applied in 2018. And how did uh, Renita or, or both of you come to learn about the scheme? I don't recall, um, remember a lot about how Renita became an NDIS participant. Um, all I knew at the time was um, maybe she was transferred over from disability services when that closed down. Um, I was, I had a lot of concerns at the start because I didn't know anything about the service and how they were going to support Renita and myself in regards to um, services and supports. Um, so, yeah, I was a bit um, concerned how that was going to work. Um, and do you remember if the NDIS they had physically come into Fitzroy Crossing? I, I can honestly say that I've only had one face-to-face um, contact with them. This was in 2020 at Carrieli at a review meeting for Renita, um, and I'm not um, aware of them. Um, even if they have come here, I wasn't aware that they've come into town because of um, no notifications. Mm-hmm. 
So is there any presence in Fitzroy Crossing of the NDIA? Um, in the past, there wasn't any. But now, um, just recently, um, Marawara's um, developed a position um, which has a uh, project coordinator, NDIS project coordinator based there. So it's a new service. So, yeah, that's on the grounds now. Um, it's a bit too early to comment on how that's working because it's only quite new. And uh, Marawara is one of the community organisations that's in Fitzroy Crossing? That's correct. And what do they generally do as far as the work that they uh, deliver? So they've got a, a range of um, different um, uh, types of work that they do. My partner works for them. So he's a um, supervisor for the CDP program. They look after the community housing and um, and they've got the um, new service, the NDIS project happening there as well. So you've got this community organisation, but do you think that the NDIA should have its own physical presence in Fitzroy Crossing? I feel that it should be a separate identity from where it is because it needs to be visual, needs to be there where people can see it, um, not in an organisation that, um, you know, certain people don't actually go to that organisation. So, therefore, I believe that it should be central, um, visual, um, People can see what it is, um, you know, if they don't know, they'll ask, what's this place, what's it for, um, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. And is there, uh, from a practical sense, is there a place in Fitzroy Crossing where that could happen? Well, at the time that I've um, provided my statement, there was a vacant um, vacant. Uh, uh, building of uh, office at the IGA complex. Um, so, yeah, that would have been the ideal place, being there where people come to meet, um, come to town to do their shopping. There's the post office there. There's the Centrelink there. There's the um, Department of Community office there and the, yeah, uh, small takeaway shop. So that would be the ideal place. Uh so back when you first became involved in the NDIS in terms of Renita signing up and being allocated a plan, did you understand back then what the NDIS was about? Not at the start. Um, the first time I found out about the um, NDIS was when Renita came home one day with a copy of one of her plans and that's um, I looked at it and I didn't understand stand it at that time. Um, yeah. Did Renita understand it at that time? No, I don't. I don't think she she did. She was just given it and she brought it to me and wanted me to help her understand it, but I couldn't understand it myself. And did anyone sit down and explain it? No, not that I can recall. Um, nobody um, explained it to us. I know that Fitzroy did have a um, information session. Um, NDIS came to town and um, provided an ND, uh, NDIS um, information session. Um, but at the time, we had missed that because we weren't aware that it was happening. And um, we found out after it was finished that it occurred, so we missed out that opportunity. Do you think that the NDIS is easy for people in the Fitzroy Valley to understand? I think it's quite difficult. Um, just being a community member, it's, um, and I'm getting like people coming up and goes, um, they don't understand their plan for one. Um, they don't understand who to contact, who's responsible. Um, it's not really clear. Um, and they get confused because there's, you know, 
you got a support coordinator, then you got a plan manager, then you got the NDIA. You know, there's three there's three different lots of people here. That's the confusing bit. Who do they contact? Who's responsible for what? Um, in one of my review meetings, I um, brought that up and I go, we need to discuss who's responsible because when we ask one service, they say, go to the other service. So we're getting chucked from one side to the other. And uh, do, have you experienced any other difficulties or, or you know, observe difficulties by other community members accessing the NDIS? So are there community members that don't have access to phone or internet or interpreters? Yeah, there's, um, there's a lot of... Um, so I've, uh, I can recall a community that's about 120 kilometres out of town with a um, client, NDIS client on it. So the family member um, had come up to me and said um, that he, he didn't understand his plan and that they needed support to um, support the family member that they were um, caring for out there. They didn't know who to contact and, and any of this. So yeah, just a lot of difficulties. Um, from other family um, individuals in the community as well, not just for me. Recently, I've um, just through my work, I've just picked up a, a new um, a Aboriginal male who was caring for his 21 year old um, son who has a disability. Uh, and I just asked him, um, Is there any services supporting you with your son? And he said, No, I've been doing it all by myself. Um, and his son doesn't have a voice, um, and I think there might be some hearing problems as well. So, therefore, I referred him over to Murrawarra to be assessed for some supports. So, there's people out there still not even um, as, um, being um, provided a service with because um, they're still, yeah, needing to be picked up and assessed. And what about now? Is your understanding of the NDIS improved or even just in relation to Renita's plan in particular? Well, I can understand that now looking at it, that there is some goals um, and them goals need to be reviewed. Um, reviewed. Um, but according to all the wordings, I, I struggle to understand uh, a lot of the wordings on the plan. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm pretty well educated, but I struggle. What more other Aboriginal people in this community, um, and English being their second or third language, you know, and so yes. And do you know, in terms of Renita's plan and looking at it, do you know how the money can be used and? Um, what the purpose of each of the supports are? Well, I can see that there's, um, she's in her plan, there's some transport money, um, which doesn't go very far because when she goes on respite to Broome, Broome is 400 kilometres away. So a lot of that funding is used up, um, you know, just about in one trip. Um, and then, therefore, um, I think this happened last year where she went on respite um, and then we were told by Far North that there was no funds left for her to get to work. So, she, therefore, she had to find her own way to work because she took that respite. And so do you think the NDIA needs to understand those distances and build that into a plan for participants in those remote areas? I think so, because Fitzroy Crossing, we have 30 plus Aboriginal communities in the Fitzroy Valley and the outlying communities. Um, and, um, and the distance from town, um, the furthest community is um, about two hours drive, uh, Nukumba community. Um, so, you know, they've got to take into consideration the, the distance 
when we're talking about transporting um, to you know, bring participants into town to access services or treatments or whatever they need to come in for. And so just talking about those distances and what services does Renita have to access and how far do they come from? So the services Renita accesses, she gets transport. Um, there is one service in town. That's the Far North Community Services. So they provide transport for her uh, to and from work um, to Wongi Radio Station. Um, they provide um, occupational therapist and they also provide a physiotherapy service. And she used to get to see them once a month, but at the moment it's um, gotten a bit better. So we have in regular contact with them through... Um, uh, fortnightly visits or um, contact through emails and um, phone calls. Mm -hmm. um, we heard just earlier that Renita's been having trouble accessing um, a hoist for the house and the car and also a replacement wheelchair. Uh, have you had uh, any dealings with the that process and do you know how long those have been delayed? Yeah, um, so back in 2020, um, when we had the review meeting at Cariuli, I, um, I've uh, found some information about a car hoist that could help us. Um, so I took that to the review meeting um, and um, we actually thought that was put in the plan back then. Um, and we kept waiting and waiting on the hoist to, to arrive because uh, it was getting quite difficult for me to lift Ranita in and out of our car. Um, I was starting to get um, um, uh, unwell um, due to having an um, issue with myopathy, which is a muscle weak weaknesses. Um, and I kind of, um, I seen my doctor to provide a support letter to try and hurry up the oyst um, and hoping that was going to work for us, but obviously it didn't. Um, the oyst did come, but then we found out there was a delay um, because um, one of the parts were missing. So we had to wait further for that to arrive back. Uh, with the, this is the um, car oyst I'm talking about. Um, and then uh, it, arrived in, I think, June the 21st, we got the car hoist. The um, OT came into town, um, trained us how to use it. Uh, so me and Marty was both trained. Um, and then uh, we returned to work and they took Ronita for a ride in the um, in their car and while they were um, getting her out of the car the oyster broke so they could not leave the oyster with us they had to take it back to Broome because it was unsafe to use so that was the oyster the car oyster um, in regards to the um, ohm oyst, the we got that um, a while ago, um, so that was sitting um, in uh, Far North office um, from April, so no one knew how to put it, put it together because um, the OT at the time, um, they were getting a new OT, so they didn't have any OT at the time, Far North. Um, and then when the new OT started, um, she came to town, put it together, brought it around to my home, and we realised that the home hoist couldn't fit down the passage because the legs on the hoist was too long to turn. So, um, and we also tried to fit it under Ronita's bed and it couldn't fit under the bed as well. So that hoist is sitting at my place, not being used at this stage. Um, the OT said that she needed to order a commode so we can lift Renita, use the oyster to lift Renita into the commode and then wheel her down to the passage. That commode turned up last week with no seat. 
So constant delays and constant and issues. Yeah. And and what about the wheelchair? The wheelchair. That's one of the biggest issues we, which is ongoing. We always got trouble with Ronita's wheelchair. The bearings pop out, the wheels fall off. Um, we struggle to fix them. We do have a, um, with the work that we can't do, we usually take it to the mechanics, but, um, you know, that's a four hour or longer, sometime longer waiting for them to um, have time to fix it between fixing up cars. So, um, Ronita has to sit on a bed and wait. Um, and sometime we go out of our way to try and um, fix it ourselves. Um, and some of the things that we did was um, I've seen uh, one week I was um, driving to work and I seen an old wheelchair on the side of the road and, um, and I drove it past it and then the week later, Renita's wheelchair stuffed up. So I went back there to look for this chair and it was gone. So I drove around the community to look for it. And then the last point was to go to the rubbish tip. I went out to the tip and I found it on top of the rubbish, um, this chair that we was exactly like Renita's that we could have used the parts. So we got that wheelchair down <laughs> off the pile of rubbish. I took it back home. Um, I've given it to Far North to uh, um, get them to fix up the chair. Um, so they took it. They came back with Renita's chair fixed and they also kept the other parts to fix other people's chairs up in the community. But is that the solution that you'd expect under the scheme? No, not at all. What difference would it make to have these things in Renita's life, to have a car hoist, a home hoist, a commode and a wheelchair? It'll make a big difference to her life and, and our lives. Um, Ronita hasn't been on holidays for quite a while now, or the whole family hasn't because of, um, you know, we can't get her in and out of our car. Um, she doesn't attend any family funerals, which is um, not good. Um, and um, she doesn't go to visit family in other towns. She's always remains in Fitzroy. Um, so yeah, it'll make a big difference. Um, and it also make a difference, um, you know, in regards to my health as well. So, um, and it'll, you know, be less stressful on us. So I'm going to ask the operator to bring up a video or two videos. The first operator, if you could display doc ID IND.0164.0002.0001. An operator, if you could also display doc ID IND.0164.0002.0001. So just for the benefit of the transcript, we just viewed a video of Topsy of you transferring Renita from her wheelchair into your vehicle, which is a, a four wheel drive style vehicle, which is higher off the ground. And you also having to load the wheelchair into the back of your vehicle. 
So in terms of our discussion earlier of the car hoist, will that remove you having to physically transfer Renita into your car? Yes, certainly. And so that would also impact on your health as yes. well. Yep. It wouldn't make a difference if you had been living in a, a larger city or town as opposed to in Fitzroy Crossing. Do you think that other communities in larger towns are treated differently? I think so because there's more opportunity for them to, um, you know, access um, other services, more services um, can, um, you know, um, get parts, get parts and um, access buses as well. Um, so, yeah, living in a remote place, we just got limited um, uh, services. We only have an um, hardware shop that we could go to um, bike, bike tyres, but they're not always um, there when we need them. And should you have to leave your community to access those things? No, I don't believe we should. We should be... Um, we should be able to have the same things that other places have. Just because we're a remote place doesn't mean we need to be left behind. And do you feel that the NDIS is flexible for Renita or for other people in the Fitzroy Valley? No, I don't think so in regards to um, family supporting. Um, um, so... Families always there for their loved ones um, and they do all the caring, they do all the supports for them. Um, so I don't think um, NDIS is flexible around having family get paid for the work that they do and yet they can pay um, strangers to come, come out and do the same work and get paid. Do you feel like the NDIA understands Renita or First Nations people? No, I don't. I don't think people understand our environment we live in um, and um, how hard it is living in remote places with limited services and limited supports. We always struggle. Um, and I can just imagine the outlying communities, how hard it is for them as well, um, not having anything out there. Um, the far north services only cater for 30k radius around Fitzroy, but like I said, we got communities further out that's missing out on a service. And there's also other barriers that exist in the valley as well in terms of housing and accessibility. Are they things that trouble you as well? Yeah, I think um, also um, uh, overcrowding issues as well. So there's not enough housing. Um, there's, yeah, just wait lists for housing everywhere. Um, so in terms of housing and Renita's experience, what happens when it floods in Fitzroy Crossing and she's staying at her house? So one year the flood waters came right up to her front door, so she had to have sandbags around her front door. Um, she couldn't get out. We had to go there in a four-wheel drive because the water was way up our tyres. So if she had to get out of there, um, she would have been under the, basically um, sitting in water up to her waist um, in the wheelchair. Um, and for her to get from um, her place to my place, she needs to go all the way around town um, on higher ground to get there because um, the shortcut is a bit of a ditch bit of a ditch area where flood waters flood and come right up to a property. And how often does it flood in Fitzroy Crossing? Well, once, once a year it would flood. Sometimes it's, um, we'll get a really big flood. And are there crocs, crocodiles? Yes, we've got a lot of um, freshwater crocs in... Um, Fitzroy River. So it's not really a safe environment to be stuck in the flood in a wheelchair that doesn't work? No. 
if you uh, could tell the big bosses of the NDIA um, your thoughts, what would you tell them? I would tell them that um, NDIA, NDIA, NDIS um, needs to make some changes to make it more pro culturally and more appropriate for um, Aboriginal people. Um, and, you know, just, it's not working for us. Look what, look what I'm going through, and I'm just one individual, one family here. What about everyone else in this community? You know, um, I'm struggling with all this. So, yeah, changes need to be made, ch better changes, and community need to be um, more consulted with in regards to what they, um, what might work for them. Um, in regards to having family support being paid and things like that. Um, we need to also, you know, um, think about the distance, like I said, the distance that people need to travel to access services. That all needs to change. Um, yeah, a lot of um, our mob is not even getting a service, like I said before. And do you think that people in the Fitzroy Valley, local people, have local solutions? I think so. My partner um, knew the issue with Ronita. Um, so um, in regards to getting to work, um, so one, one day uh, Ronita said, I need to get myself to work. And I said, well, what's happening with the bus? Uh, um, and she said, well, the bus is gone to Broome to take people for respite. So when that happens, the whole town comes to a standstill. Um, so my partner said, well, you know, I'm happy to put my hand up and um, I want to try and support NDIS um, with transport. So he was thinking about going into um, a business to provide a service. Um, he approached Far North to be subcontracting with them, but they didn't appear to be interested. So he went to Perth and he um, attended an uh, office in Perth um, and he went to um, speak to the person at the front desk and he said, um, he asked, what does he need to do to be a registered service provider? And the person at the desk said, I don't know, it's, on my, it's my first day on the job. And he said, well, can I speak to your manager? And he said, well, I am the manager. He didn't get anywhere that day, but he has. He went to the extent of getting himself an ABN number, but the barriers for him is just too hard to get over. So there is people in our community who want to help but struggle. And so there's also a large administrative burden on those people as well. Yes, it is. Yep. Topsy, if, if you had a message for other Aboriginal people who might be listening or Torres Strait Islander people who might be listening, would you like to share a me any message for them? I'd just like to say that we all have our own stories um, and we all need to stand together to be strong, um, to, um, to support each other um, for change in this area, which is a big need because it's not working, not working for us, not working for our mob. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to tell the commissioners? Yeah, I just, um, I feel proud that I can stand here and speak up for my people. Um, and hopefully my story can have a bit of an impact on, on change. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you, uh, Topsy. You uh, have been there and speaking up for your people, and that's one of the functions of the Royal Commission. 
and uh, it's a privilege for us to give people that opportunity and to see it taken advantage of. Thank you. If you don't mind, I'll ask my colleagues as to whether they have any questions for you, and I'll start with Commissioner Mason. <clears throat> Um, thank you, Topsy, for your evidence today. And thank you, Marty, for being there as well. Um, and for your daughter to be there, it's um, your family. And so we appreciate uh, the work that you've done to prepare for um, today to give you evidence. Um, we've heard a lot about family and the importance of family in communities, in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and that sometimes that's not understood. Um, we've also heard how things need to be understood at a local level and at a family level, and that family is you know, really integral to supporting our family members who have a disability. And in your statement, um, to me, uh, paragraph um, 71 and 72 really emphasise the ripple effect of people letting down uh, a person with disabilities as well as their family. Um, because you talk about uh, something that you uh, were suffering with last year um, around muscle weakness. You had to spend time in hospital, very stressed. Um, it really was debilitating. Um, even to the point of not being able to, to keep your own car and having to get a different car, <clears throat> not being able to take Renita to funerals because you didn't have the equipment to lift her, uh, trips to uh, Darwin interstate, not able to take your family and see your family because you weren't able to have the voice. And there's this ripple effect that happens and it accumulates and it accumulates when those solutions that are promised don't get delivered. And so I just want to say a really big thank you for laying it all out for um, myself and also my colleagues, because it's really given a very clear example of uh, the a simple process of ordering equipment through an OT. And yet in a remote area, the golden rule in delivering equipment into a remote area is that it must be robust and it must um, be durable over a much longer period than being in the city because the services to maintain and repair are often not there in that local community. So the equipment's got to be really durable. And these, these are like number one rules, uh, working and living in remote areas. So, you know, you get a hoist that's broken on its first go, uh, wheelchairs not being maintained, commode, parts missing. Um, it's like you know, you're ordering from an overseas business and you're waiting in the post for something that, you know, you're just hoping it works. And we're talking about a system that is supposed to be operating in Australia and in a remote community. These, the, these, um, these are small but very important uh, decisions for uh, well-being um, and for proper help within a remote community. And so I'm sure, you know, uh, people across Australia listening to evidence today um, uh, are in no way now um, under any misconception around how things work at a family level, at a community level from your evidence today. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you very much. It's, um, it's been a privilege. And as a grandmother, um, grandmothers are they're the glue in the community. Grandfathers are the glue in the community. And, um, you know, listening to you and others today, it's like listening to expert panels. You know, you've got so much lived experience, but, you know, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people are always problem solvers. Um, always looking for the way to make the, the, the way through. And that's what, you know, you've told us today yeah. um, around the problem solving, going to the tip to find a, a, a wheelchair so that it can be used as a, um, a toolkit for your daughter's wheelchair. I mean, this is what happens. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. 
Thank you, Commissioner Mason, but don't write off the grandfathers, please. Uh, Commissioner <laughs> McEwen. Uh, no questions. I too want to add my thanks and appreciation to uh, all of you for, for your very compelling uh, story and experiences. Thank you. Uh, Topsy, I just had a couple of questions about the plan. We have in the documents uh, that have been put together for the purposes of the hearing, the plan uh, for 2020 to 2021, actually May 2020 to May 2021. The total provided was about $101,000. That appears from tab 41 of uh, the bundle uh, volume C. And then if we go to tabs uh, 54 and 55, you don't need to worry about the tab numbers. We see that of that amount, only 57,000 was spent. Do, do you know why only 57,000 out of the 101,000 was spent in 2021? Yes, um, at the time, COVID was one issue, so we were a bit scared on um, Ronita um, leaving the community, leaving Fitzroy, because COVID was um, around at that time. Um, and also the other issue was that um, my family was on sorry side, so there was a death in my family. My brother had passed away in Broome, and um, that was the other issue. Okay, thank you for that. The plan that is currently in force appears behind tab 52, and it's in operation from October 2021 till October 2023, and it provides uh, for a total during that period of $248,000. When we look at uh, the amount that has been expended between October 2021 and at the end of February 2022, there's only 18,000 that's been spent out of that 248,000. So that's, only a, that's a, only a proportion of the amount that one might have expected to be spent. I'm just wondering if you know the reason why the expenditure is below what you would expect. Yeah, Ronita um, has been requesting respite for quite a while. Um, um, and through um, far north, um, but their bus hasn't um, been able to take her, so uh, they haven't been able to support in that area. Um, we have a lack of services in town as well. Um, and just uh, at the moment, Renita used to have a cleaner. We used to um, help clean her, her home. Um, when COVID started, they um, left... Uh, cleaning for Ronita to go to the schools um, to do the cleaning. So that sort of took that service away from um, her getting that service from them as well. The plan uh, provided uh, some monies for assistive technology. Um, has that arrived for Ronita? Do you know? Well, I don't really know what that word means. I see. So this is one of the issues I spoke about in the plan, that these big words is really hard for us to understand. Okay, I, I, I understand that. And just one more question. Uh, there's provision for um, a support coordinator. Is it, do, you, do you know who the support coordinator is? Yeah, I'm, we know it, uh, the support coordinator is... Um, he uh, sits in um, Perth, um, which is over two and a half thousand kilometres away, I believe, um, something like that. Um, we we haven't seen him um, for about approximately two years now, um, but he does ring up on um, on the phone and um, and contact us through phone. Does he help with the delays that you've referred to concerning the wheelchair and so on? Well, Ronita contacts him as well, and so do, do I in regards to this. He tries to um, support, but we're still not getting anywhere, even with that support. All right. Thank you very much. Again, I 
repeat uh, what Commissioner Mason and Commissioner McEwen have said. We very much appreciate the very clear and straightforward and frank way in which you have uh, explained the experiences that you have had and that Renita has had. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Rago, do we now adjourn for a well-earned lunch? Yes, Chair, to 2.25 p.m. You're Central been Time. very tough. All right, we'll adjourn till 2.25. Thank you. The Royal Commission is now adjourned. Silence, please. The Royal Commission is now in session. Yes, Mr. Rudd. Commissioners, our next witness is Jessica, who appears on screen. Jessica's two sons have pseudonyms Big Fella for her eldest son and Little Fella for her younger son, and that's um, uh, pseudonym direction CTH-DNP-00136. Uh, Jessica has already uh, been administered the oath. Thank you very much, Jessica. Thank you for being prepared to come and give evidence to the uh, Royal Commission. And uh, I know that uh, you have had a previous engagement with the Royal Commission through a video recording. So thank you very much for the contribution you have made. And we look forward to hearing your evidence uh, today. I'd just like to make sure you know where everybody is. I'm in the uh, Alice Springs hearing room. On my left is Commissioner Mason. On my right is Commissioner McEwen and Ms. Tarago, who I will ask uh, to ask you some questions, uh, is also in the Alice Springs hearing group. So I'll now ask Ms. Tarago to ask you some questions. Jessica, today you're appearing from Broome? Yes. Uh, on the 8th of June this year, do you remember speaking with me about the experiences of you and your family? Yes, I do. And during those conversations, are the things that you told me true and correct? Yes, they are. Okay. Um, operator, can you please play the pre-recorded video statement doc ID IND.0173.0004 .0001. So thanks for joining me today, Jessica. Um, we're going to talk about the experiences that you've had and um, that your sons have had with the NDIS and um, the, the things that you're going to speak about today, are they your experiences? Yes. And uh, what you say is the truth to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Um, Jessica, who are your mob? Well, I'm from Broome. Originally, so my mob is all the Yarrow and Nimunburu people. And um, you're currently living on your partner's homeland? Yes. And um, you have two children together? Yes, we do. And um, who are his mob, if you don't mind me asking? Um, his mob, uh, Puniendi, Wanmajari and Bunava. And... Um, with your two sons, how old are they? My oldest is five in October and my baby is four in December. And your your boys have got a disability? Um, yes, has been diagnosed with autism and has been diagnosed with GDD and is showing traits, signs of autism and ADHD. Okay. And... Um, when did you find out about their diagnosis? Um, I would say I found out roughly two years ago when I noticed he wasn't like the other kids his age. He wasn't talking or communicating with me and my partner. And then 
we noticed his yeah same time around two years ago okay um and can you tell me a little bit about your sons and what they'd like to do um yeah well my oldest son he is he likes to play by himself but he does he's very independent he's very smart if he can't do something or something stuck or tangled he knows how to untangle it and how to unstuck it he finds another way around the obvious so yeah he's he's his own little little person oh thank you for sharing that and what about your little fellow <clears throat> he's always on the go he's always running he's always jumping he's always climbing but he's very loving and he's always kissing and hugging me and his father so yeah, he, he's yeah they're both their own little persons you wouldn't put them any other way so jessica can you tell me a little bit about the boys relationship with their siblings yeah so the, my two sons they have um, two older brothers and older sister so my older son has a very good bond with the two oldest brothers, which, you know, shows him and teaches him all of the, you know, indigenous and cultural ways that things need to be done, you know, fishing or hunting. And then, you know, my baby, he has a connection with his older sister, you know, where she loves swimming and fishing. So he follows her fishing and swimming and, you know, collecting all the gagar or we call them freshwater mussels here. Um, it's a teaching and learning process for them and so it would be really hard if they um had to move for services and couldn't be near their siblings yes they actually get physically sick so when they went to spend time with their mother the older ones yeah yeah they weren't feeling very well so so really important to keep family together and so um, living on country, that's something that's important for you? For, yeah, for me, my partner and my kids, they, they can understand and communicate with their grandparents in their language and Creole. So every time we go fishing, so they call the water Aba or Ngaba. So they say that Ngaba and, you know, for Turkey, when we go shooting, they say Galamura. So, you know, they're making the turkey signs and the language itself. So even when we're fishing, knows to get the, my oldest knows to get the fishing bag and the bucket. And even when we go shooting and we've got something, he knows that he jumps out and he helps me drag it over to where the fire is and helps me prepare plucking or skinning or whatever we catch. So. It's important to us to show them that instead of just putting them in front of a TV or giving them a phone just so that they can just go sit in the corner and kind of just not irritate anybody. And so um, you're really highlighting their abilities and what they can do and what they enjoy doing, which is being with family and out on country. Yep. <clears throat> um, and so they speak language. Um, uh, help do they communicate ordinarily? Is it in language and a mix with other things? Well, with my oldest, he we've been implementing a lot of sign languages at home and he's been learning them at school as well. So, you know, he does a lot for the bush animals, you know, he does sign for turkey, kangaroo, and yeah, thank you and more. So he's he's got that and then when we kind of out in his element, you know, he's talking his language, you know, he's, his mind's like always going, 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 going. It's just, yeah, you have to see it to kind of understand it, the difference, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and if you wouldn't mind me telling me about it yourself, so you're currently working and studying? Yes, uh, my studies are on hold at the moment until I find a suitable kind of moment where I can put 
the baby in daycare because at the moment it's it's yeah it's kind of expensive with only one income because my partner's not working at the moment and um in the future you hope to be um a financial counselor yes that is one of my aspects to get through to doing <laughs> Um, and you've got a really strong passion for helping community work through some financial literacy and things like that. Yes, I do. Yeah. Um, so, Jessica, I just want to talk a little bit about um, the NDIS and how you came to know about them. Um, do you remember when you first heard about the NDIS? Um, yes, I first heard about it from my mother <clears throat> saying, you know, because I told her my concerns about my oldest child. And she said, you know, get him assessed and then, you know, get them to refer you to NDIS and all of that. And then I kind of didn't want to believe he had, there was something wrong with him. So until NDIS actually came to Fitzroy Crossing and kind of more or less promoted NDIS or kind of make a presence that they're, in the Kimberleys and that they're there for help. And so, so, so they, they then came into community? <clears throat> yeah. And did you have an, um, a sit down with anyone at that time? Um, yes, I actually made <clears throat> um, contact with um, one of the mob that came over and so they kind of linked up with um, the girls at Man and Wantakura here. So, yeah, Cheyenne gave me a call and said, you know, they want to meet up. And because I think that's when we actually got a diagnosis from the pediatrician that he had GDD. And then, yeah, from there we had the interview and, yeah. <laughs> and, um, do you remember um, whether it was a man or a woman that you sat down with and how um, that fit in culturally for you? Well, it was, at first, it was two ladies and, and a man that came promoting NDIS. And then when I went and done the, the plan, the planning was with a man itself. And, and how did you feel about that, sitting down with the man talking? I didn't feel comfortable. That's why I invited my partner with me to, to do the plan. Uh, and would you have needed any interpreters or your partner needed any interpreters to come with you or um, either on the first time when they first came in or that plan that you were just talking about? Um, not in the first instance, because I'm pretty good with mainstream English and mainstream society itself. Um, but if it was for someone that doesn't have the schooling or the literacy and numeracy skills that I have, they wouldn't not have understood any of the words that they were talking about. So um, do you think interpreters would have been needed for other community members who might have struggled to understand? Yes, and and probably a presence of an Indigenous worker. And what difference does it make to have an Indigenous worker there? It's, it's more of a connection. When you're sitting down with a non-Indigenous person, you know, you really feel threatened. You know, you have to kind of, that's why a lot of people just say yes, yes, yes. Well, you know, if it was an Indigenous person, like a liaison officer that was there, you would have felt more comfortable and it'd been less daunting on you. So, it, you know, the you'd be able to get a bit more um, engagement between community and the NDIS if you had an Indigenous worker there. Yes. Um, and from that first time that there was a physical presence of NDIS in Fitzroy, um, do you remember where that was? Like, where did they have that sit down? Um, so they came and sat with me here at the Early Child Learning Centre. 
and I think they went out to other communities and they also went to the um, adult learning center here in the town. And are they places that are easily accessible in community? Um, it depends on because there's 39 little communities around Fitzroy Crossing. So, you know, not really knowing that someone's here to help you with your child that may have these disabilities. Like if you live 120 k's out on a dirt road, you wouldn't have any idea that they were here. Yeah. Um, can I ask about the, the plan that you were talking about? Um, did you understand the plan when you were given it? Um, not at first, and I still don't now. Um, I just kind of understand that they're there for those certain supports, but kind of I don't understand what can come under those supports and what can be considered as, you know, therapy or things to help my children be where they need to be. Yeah. And so do you access a portal? <clears throat> yes, I do. And is that easy to understand? The portal is very easy for me. The plan managers are very good with sending me statements and invoices. So I look at the invoices um, before they get paid. So I approve them before they get paid. So it's a good system like that for me to understand. But for other people, I don't, yeah, probably think that they would understand. Yeah. And do all people in Fitzroy Crossing have access to the internet, for example? No, not a lot of people. Not a lot of people do. Um, and, and just looking at those invoices that you you said you've been approving, um, is there a, a lot of information for you to understand how things are calculated? Yeah, I, I understand that side of it. And I understand because <clears throat> it's very detailed on the, the plan managers that I use. It's like really cut down and broken down to where where all the money is going. So it's, it's good. That's good. Um, and what about when you need to contact the NDIS? How do you normally do that? I normally just ring the office. And um, do you speak with any Aboriginal staff at all? Or you know? um, Every time I've called, I've probably called like three times and, yeah, it's not a lot of Indigenous people. And so do you think they understand um, you or what it's like in community? Um, they would probably understand a person like me. But, yeah, like I said before, someone that doesn't have the schooling that I've had, they probably wouldn't have understood them and they wouldn't have understood NDIS. So. Yeah. And um, do you think it would be important to have a physical office in Fitzroy Crossing? Um, yes, a physical anything, actually, in Fitzroy Crossing. And um, it, why is that? Is face-to-face -face better <clears throat> for community? Well, I can speak for myself. I relate to people more physically because then I can read their body language. I can see what they're feeling you know, if they respond negative or positive to what I'm saying then I know you know them as a character and do you think that's a similar experience for other people in community yes I do because all indigenous people or well, most indigenous people I know are visual people you know you put a piece of paper in front of them with words on it they wouldn't understand what is being what they're talking about. And if you come in, if someone was to come in with a big graph and a big board and came in in person to break down and answer the questions that people may have, then you know a lot of Indigenous people would understand. Um, Jessica, I want to ask you some questions about services. Are there any local support services in Fitzroy Crossing? None whatsoever. There is a presence of Far North Community Services. It's pretty much just 
um, to support workers now. There used to be um, a beautiful lady that used to work there. She no longer works here now. Um, yeah, she would always keep me updated with whatever's coming up or, you know, things like that. Even the community itself, you know, doesn't really have, you know, a presence in the community for kids with disabilities or, you know, it's, yeah, there's no services whatsoever. Um, have you turned to any other local services like Manan um, that you mentioned before? who might also provide different types of support? So I, I do. I see Manan here for the support workers that they have here on the ground. So they let me know when the, the therapists are coming. So they come out every three weeks for like an hour and a half. So you know, both my sons do therapy an hour and a half that day. And then they kind of drop off for, th for three weeks and then they're back again. So it's like it makes a difference, but then it doesn't really because it's not a consistent, you know, week by week or every fortnight, it's every three weeks. Mm. And did COVID sort of interrupt that for a while? It has actually. We, we didn't receive any services for over a month, maybe two months because of COVID. And um, what effect did that have on your boys? Um, probably therapeutically because of the, what they were doing. The, Cause I, I do everything repetitive anyway. So whatever the therapists do with them in that session, I kind of implement that at home for those three weeks. So for myself, I can say my my kids don't really drop off as much as other kids, kids probably would. Yeah. Um, and would it be important for you to have local services as opposed to people coming from outside community? It would be better for local services, yes, because they, they would have an understanding on how we live and, you know, what we face day to day or, you know, monthly or seasonally, you know, it's just, yeah, just NDIS just doesn't understand what it's like to live remotely or on a dirt road that can be blocked off by water or by flood, you know, or even the shopping prices here that can affect the way our children eat. And, and just talking about floods, it uh, happens quite often during wet season that the whole town is even cut off. Is that right? Yeah. Well, I live 30 k's out. So when it floods, we, I don't, we don't have access to anything for two weeks. Um, and at the moment, where are services coming in from to support well, you and your boys? So we've got our services coming from Broome. So we've got Far North and Patches coming in from Broome every three weeks. And the, how long does it take to drive from Broome to, to you? Um, well, if I'm in town, that's 397 Ks. Um, if I was out at home, that would be 430. So it's quite a distance and... Um, <clears throat> time for someone to come into community and I would imagine going into Broome for example um, it would probably take a little bit longer if you had to have breaks. Yep. Um, I want to talk a little bit about respite. What does respite look to you? Like if you, if you could have it in a perfect um, situation for you and your boys what would it look like? some rest for me <laughs> yeah um I've inquired about respite there isn't anything that's in the vicinity of Fitzroy Crossing or in Broome and you just even here in Fitzroy you know even when I'm at work the respite it would, it would be nice just to have someone to take the kids for two hours so I can clean you know, the house properly or, you know, do the whole 
load of washing that's sitting in the laundry. You know, it doesn't have to be about me all the time, but. And um, what about local respite for the boys? What um, kind of activities do you think they would like to do? Well, anything to do with being outdoors, they hate being indoors. They, it's, yeah, we could, we could never, ever close them up inside. We've always got them outside. So, you know, we've always, we've bought the swing set, we bought the jungle gym and, you know, the seesaws that all came out of our pockets so that they can keep staying in their yard. But, yeah, they still tend to go to the neighbor's house or. And so if you had to leave um, your home now to move closer to services or closer to more regular respite, um, what effect would that have on, on you and the kids to be away from country? It, it'll have a big impact because even when we go to Broome to see my family, they hate it. They hate being in the car for the four hours of traveling just to go see my family. And it's just, they don't like change. They don't like new. So it's just, it's very hard for them to be away from something they've always known or people they've always known. So. And, and what about if, for example, you had to go to somewhere like Perth, would that um, be even more different for them? Yes. And how would you think they'd go in a city? Well, they have, my both of my boys have sensory issues. So, you know, some of them, both of them don't like very bright lights or very loud noises. So being in the city that's always busy, so always bright, always loud, I, I don't know how they'd go for themselves or even the plane ride there. Wouldn't, I wouldn't know how they'd respond, you know, to the, the cabin pressure on the plane or the turbulence. So, yeah, not going to drive down there because that's 26 hours. <laughs> um, and so living and, and being <clears throat> at Bush and on country is, um, do you see that as part of their health and well-being? Yes, because... They were raised here. Okay, so or they've had that automatic connection anyway. They 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 know when it's cold weather, they know the plants, the water, you know, the dirt. You know, it's like an unseen connection that you just can't really explain unless you actually sit and you pay attention to how they respond to the changes, you know, the seasonal changes or to the changes in anything that's just so norm to them. And the Matawara has got a, a really significant um, meaning for people in the Fitzroy Valley region. Yeah, it does. And is that some of the connection that you're talking about? It's to places and ceremony and, and all of those in, things being interconnected? Yep. Um, do you think that the NDIS is flexible? Um, <clears throat> myself, I've I've asked for certain things, and they've they've responded to me saying that does not cover. Or that does not come under this, you know, what it the funding. So I've I've had to go out and purchase a Wi-Fi so that I can, you know, receive emails or liaise with the the therapists or the support coordinators when I'm blocked off or even when I'm not reachable, when I don't go to work. So where I live, it's not a lot of reception out there. So those sorts of things are really important um, for you to be able to communicate properly for your boys. 
Um, and do you think the NDIS is culturally appropriate for you and your son? Um, not really, because I don't think they understand much about culture or how a child with autism connects to culture and tradition because I don't think it's really seen much or heard of much <clears throat> for someone with, you know, a disability to be on country, to be in that element where they feel normal. And um, is that cultural learning uh, that's really important not only for Aboriginal people but um, for non-Indigenous people to learn? Yes. I would say so, being, you know, the oldest, you know, people in the world at the moment, you know, you kind of have to learn about it to understand it. So you have to educate yourself first before you can, you know, understand another person's culture. Jessica? Um if you could tell the NDIA your views um, today, what would you tell them? Um, I would <clears throat> tell them to come out and see for yourself the struggle that we have with having no services for children with my, that has disabilities like my kids or, you know, the understanding of what it's like to live in a remote community with the limited services. And if you could design what the NDIS look like, would you have any ideas that you would be happy to share? Um, <clears throat> get some Indigenous people in there. Get them out along with you when you when they come. You know, it's like... It, it's more better to connect and understand the NDI, what NDIA is coming to a community for. If you, know, if you have an Indigenous person to, you know, not advise but mediate. And if they were to come out to community, how long should that be for? Instead of coming for like two or three days, maybe come for a week, you know, like have more of a welcoming thing, you know, have a barbecue and put more flyers out and, you know, encourage outside communities to come into the town. Or if they go to the communities, you know, like have a barbecue at the hall, you know, and put things up around and kind of make, like promote themselves on why they there. And would you expect them to create a base there or would they be fly in, fly out? Um, it would be good because of Fitzroy, because of the surrounding communities, if they did have an office there. And does that go back to what you were saying about being able to read someone's body language and knowing them? Yeah. And for the First Nations people who might be listening, do you have any message for them if they've had the same experience as you and your family? Just don't be shame. Because when it comes to your kids, they're your next generation. They're the ones that have to follow in your footsteps. And then they leave the next generation. Is there anything else that you wish to tell the commissioners today? Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's difficult to say the things that I want to say. Yeah, it's just. Thank you, Chair. I know it's uh, difficult to say the things you want to say, but you have told us uh, uh, a lot. Well, I, will ask, I will ask uh, 
the other commissioners if they have any questions for you. And I'll ask Commissioner Mason first. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Jessica, for your uh, evidence today. Uh, your boys, your oldest is five in October and your baby is four in December. So these important learning years are happening now as well as uh, school and what happens inside the school gate. Um, what's your preparation in supporting your children in your local community in their learning, um, ensuring that they, they have an inclusive education uh, there in your local school? What's, what are you doing now or what are you thinking about? Well, with the school, I've given them the reports of my oldest son's autism. So I've actually um, also got in touch with the therapist to see if they can come into his classroom and offer his teacher their teaching techniques or their therapy techniques to help with my oldest son's education. And um, has the school been open to these ideas? Or are you still to talk to them about it? Yes, they have. They're just actually searching for funding and searching for a special needs teacher to actually come in and work at the school with my son. And do you talk to other parents in the community who have children um, with disability and who would be going to that school? Or have you spoken to parents who are already there and what their experiences are if they have children with disability? Um, yeah, well, a lot of families or a lot, it's many of the mothers that come up to me and ask me to help them understand what the NDIS means for their child and, you know, where services that they can go to or who they can get in contact with. And, yeah, it's kind of, I've kind of been the go-to person. About. So the other, other parents want to maximise the time their children are in school and they're asking you about what supports are available to make that a really rich experience. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Commissioner McEwen. Uh, thank you. Jazika, uh, thank you for your evidence. I have one question. When your boys were diagnosed with, in particular, autism, what information or what kind of information or support were you referred to or were you given contact about where you might get information? Um, the NDS fella that did the interview for my oldest son, he gave me a link to click onto and to read through because um, I've never, I've only heard of autism from my mother and culturally we don't really pick up on disabilities in our children unless it's physical where we can see you know, face on, but when it comes to behavioural or neurological stuff that all lying under beneath stuff, we, I had no idea. I read about it and, you know, asked heaps of questions and, yeah, I kind of got the information that I needed. Thank you. Uh, Jessica, in 2021-2022, uh, that is from July to uh, April 2021, this year, just now, um, was how much of the, what proportion of uh, the NDIS plan was actually spent? Was there any money left over or, or was it uh, all spent? It, not even half of it was spent. Not even a quarter of it was spent. And why was there so much unspent? Because the lack of services. What would you, sorry, what would you have liked to be able to spend money on for the boys? Consistent services, consistent therapies. Instead of coming out every three weeks just for an hour or an hour and a half, and then you come and bill me over $2,000 just for the hour or hour and a half, it's like, why, when you didn't really do much? And the plan provided, did it, for much more intensive therapy for the boys than, in fact, they received? Yes. Because of their disabilities, they took that into consideration on early intervention to help them get ready for school. So I think that's why they gave them 
such a large amount. There have not been the services available that allow you and the boys to undertake that preparation for school. Yeah, they didn't take in consideration of what services were firstly in Fitzroy to designate that such amount. Do you have any ideas as to why the NDIA would be unaware of these difficulties at the time they approve the plan? They're fairly obvious, aren't they? Yeah, they're obvious if they were if they did their research, if they actually had a presence in the community first, and to understand, you know, like go out and see the networks in the community, you know. What is there first? And what happens to the unspent money, do you know? Um, well, I just did a rollover of both of my children's um, NDIS plans. They extended it for two years. And I did very make it very clear of the person that did the review. It's like, what is he going to spend on? There's no services here for three weeks. So, in effect, you've been able to carry over the unspent money for the next period. Yeah, I've even inquired, I've even asked them for a support worker in that three weeks gap to, you know, to take them and, you know, teach them things. And they said that I wasn't, uh, they weren't approved for it. It wasn't, there's no money in the funding for a support worker. Yeah, I see. Thank you very much. Jessica, that's been very, very helpful. Thank you for giving evidence today. And thank you also for uh, participating in the session with Ms. Tarago uh, in uh, June. Thank you so much. Thank you. Should we adjourn now for a short period or do we go straight on? Uh, we can move straight on. That's Chair. fine. Let us, let us move straight on. Thank you, Chair. Um, commissioners, we will next hear from Maram Montakura Women's Resource Centre and we'll be hearing from the Chief Executive Officer, uh, Emily Carter, and Lauren Rice, who's a research uh, fellow and works at the Marulu team at Manamontakura. Both will be giving evidence from Manamontakura office in Fitzroy Crossing. Emily and Lauren have prepared a joint statement that's dated the 20th of June this year. And the statement can be found at Hearing Bundle A, Tab 63. Annexures to the statement can be found at Hearing Bundle A, Tabs 64 to 76. And both witnesses will take an affirmation. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Ms Carter, Dr Rice, thank you very much for the statement uh, that you have jointly prepared, which uh, we have uh, read uh, with uh, care. It's a very detailed statement. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for uh, being prepared to give uh, evidence today to the Royal Commission. Um, I'd just like to explain uh, where you probably know, but where everybody is, just to be clear. Uh, we're in the Alice Springs uh, hearing room where Ms. Tarago has uh, just uh, introduced you. Uh, on my left is Commissioner Mason. On my right is Commissioner McEwen. We are the three commissioners who are responsible for the conduct of uh, this uh, hearing, which happens to be designated as Public Hearing uh, 24. Um, I'll be grateful then if you would follow the instructions of my um, associate who will administer uh, the, the affirmations in each case. The affirmation. Thank you. I will read you both the affirmation. At the end, please both say yes or I do. Do you both solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, now, Ms. Tarago will ask you some questions. Thank you, Chair. Emily, you're a proud Gunyani Kija woman from central Kimberley region in Western Australia. Uh, could you tell the commissioners uh, about your background and experience? Mm, okay. Um, yes, 
Firstly, I want to um, acknowledge the Bunawa people on which land that where we live and work here in Fitzroy Crossing. Um, yes, I am a um, Gija Gunyandi woman from the central Kimberley. I come from stolen generation parents. My mother was taken from the Fitzroy Valley and my father was taken from the East Kimberley from a community called um, Violet Valley, which is part of Wadman community. So I haven't, I wasn't brought up in a very cultural environment, but certainly I do. Um, coming back to live and work in Fitzroy Crossing in 94 has um, immersed me back into my mother's um, language group. My life has been one of um, working, when I started working as a 16 year old for the Department of Community Welfare in 1975, in which at that time was, we were just almost at the end of the white Australia policy when indigenous people was able to go back on country and, start to be excited about um, living on their traditional lands, which here in the Kimberley was known as the homeland movement. And government believed that Aboriginal people could make a future for themselves. And we as Aboriginal people certainly thought that we could make a future as well. So here in the Fitzroy Valley, we have about 36 Indigenous communities, they range from very big communities to very small communities. And I worked in welfare for a very, very long time. I grew up in the Department of Community Welfare from 16 to 33 until I moved here to Fitzroy Crossing. So what I've seen over the years amongst our Indigenous people has been one of optimism around building their futures and then having all of those things taken away from them. So where we are today is around our people having to wait for services to be delivered to them when they can get those services, which is a far cry from self-determination, by the way when that was the whole point of homeland movements. And you're the Chief Executive Officer of Maramudukura Women's Resource Centre? Uh, yes, I am. I became the Chief Executive um, Officer of Maramudukura Women's Resource Centre in April 2017. Prior to that, it was June Oscar. And as we all know, June went on to become the Social Justice Commissioner. And um, Lauren, if I could also get you to ex explain to the commissioners what your role and also your uh, education experience at Manawatukura. Yeah, so I'm a research fellow employed through the University of Sydney. I've been working in the disability sector for 19 years this year. Uh, the past 11 have been in the academic area. So I did my PhD in uh, mental health in people with developmental disabilities. And then I joined Emily and the team at Marn in, in late 2018 to work on the Biggest One Kid project. And then started living up here in 2019. I've been here more or less ever since. Um, because the NDIS rollout began late 2019, 2020, and I had experience in the disability sector. Emily asked me to be involved um, in just some of the consultation. So I've been around pretty much since they began the consultation, uh, just listening and watching and explaining to Emily how it differs um, in some ways to what I've seen in Sydney and other parts of Australia. And you're continuing that work now. Yes. Um, Emily, could you, for the benefit of those who haven't read your statement, explain to the Royal Commission what Manawantukura Women's Resource Centre does. Okay. Women's Resource Centre provides a range of um, services and 
programs for women and children of the Fitzroy Valley. So, but physical um, infrastructure, we run a women's refuge. Uh, we have a legal unit. So we have a lawyer that represents women in court for BROs or family law court matters. And we have a social worker and a counsellor. And we also run our early learning centre and our child and parent centre. And we also um, have another unit called the Maralu. Maralu in Gija means um, precious, worth nurturing, and that's also a vulnerable word as well. So there, the, um, the Maralu is part... Um, was set up after we we um, did the first prevalence into fetal alcohol spectrum disorder to um, explain to families about what came out of that research and how do we support the families who's got children with complex needs in the Fitzroy Valley. So we have, uh, um, I think we have about 55 full-time staff and about 35 part-time. Earlier we heard evidence from Mudge and he uh, explained the different language groups. I'm going to ask the operators to display doc ID MWRC.9999.000 dot zero one one seven. Is that um, appearing for you on your screen? Yes. 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 Uh, if you could just take us through what that map rep represents. That map represents all the, um, the language groups in the Fitzroy Valley, and they're all colour coded for the different language groups. One of the things about the language groups also is the fact that the Fitzroy River is shared by all of the, um, uh, the language groups. The um, language groups that are closer to the river are uh, also known as the river people, which is Guniandi and Bunaba. And the outer um, language groups are um, the desert communities, which is the Walmajeri and the Nyigana and the Wonka Yunka people. Um, they, they're those, when I talked earlier about the homeland movement, that's the homelands that we're talking about here. That have now, where people have set up their communities. And the township itself of Fitzroy Crossing is a central place for all it's of those central language groups. Place, it's the central place for all of these language groups where they come in to do their food shopping and to go to the hospital or to to um, catch the bus out of here where the services is Fitzroy is the main service area for for these languages and there are also other um, groups that are outside of what we see in the map that may travel through to Fitzroy Crossing to access services they wouldn't otherwise have yes of course and if you think about Aboriginal um, language groups, it's also the um, how you're connected to the next language. So through that, um, through the um, um, song lines and that, people also come and they access services or they come to see relatives or and friends as well. So, and we're on the highway. We're on the Great Northern Highway, so we do have a lot of um, traffic through here as well. Um, I'll also ask the operator to display photo, uh, doc ID MWRC.9999.0001.0117. Wow. Is that displayed for you? Yes, yes. And what's that a photo of? 
That's the photo of our main river in full flood. Um, and that, you know, when the water, when it's in full flood, um, the amount of water that goes under that bridge can um, fill up the Sydney Harbour every 12 hours. So a lot of water goes under there and um, unfortunately we also have pastoralists that are looking to extract water from our rivers and the river is our life. Um, it gives us, every time the floods come, it's like it's renewing everything for us. And earlier we watched a video of Mudge talking about his connection to the Matwara. And during that video, the river was quite bare during that particular season. So is it a famine and fast in, in terms of, um, oh, feast, sorry, a famine and, or feast in terms of the floodwaters that might travel through that country through the seasons? Yeah, very much so. And you can't guarantee because of climate change whether you're going to have a good wet season. And um, <clears throat> um, so we do, earlier this year, we had a um, reasonable enough wet season, but the, the river isn't full all the time. There are pockets of um, parts of the river where there's water, all year round, but most times it's um, it's uh, it's not running at all. But it is a precious precious system for us. It's um, this is where we go to get relief from the from what's going on in your day. Um, it brings families together. We use the river to it's to. Um, it's like medicine for us to help us with our mental health and to be able to de-stress, but it's also us, that gives us food as well. So we um, get fish from the river and our freshwater prawns, which we call cherubims over this way, but we get those things always in season. And when the water flows out of the Fitzroy River and onto the Fitzroy Plains, well, then they're filling up our billabongs. And so that water isn't just seen as going out to sea, that it is rejuvenating and filling up our aquifers all along the, all along the Fitzroy River. And it's filling up our billabongs and that. So there's, it's the cycle of life. And it's the only, it is seen as the second wildest um, flowing river in the world beside the Amazon. So it's, it's in everybody's interest to care for this river. Thank you. Thank you, Operator. Um, Lauren, uh, could you tell the commissioners about, um, uh, well, I'll firstly start, both of you co-authored the NDIS uh, Commission report, people don't know what good looks like. Um, can you tell the commissioners about how and why Mane Wantakura was approached to prepare that report for the Valley? Yeah, so there were um, a range of different NDA representatives coming up to the Valley to meet with people, with Emily and other CEOs of Aboriginal community controlled organisations. Um, and they were sort of all coming to listen and and say and the CEOs were saying the same thing, but they didn't feel heard. And we were fortunate enough that during one of those consultations, an Aboriginal woman who worked for the NDAA, Simone Kenmore, was there. Um, and she could see the frustration in the CEOs feeling unheard um, and told us that she'd done a similar consultation with Palm Island and asked us um, if we wanted to do one ourselves to help raise the voice of the community. And so um, they had some, the NDIA proposed some questions that they wanted asked around what a good life looks like and what kind of disability supports people want. Um, and then Emily met with the board and other people to find out what else 
they, the community wanted to ask um, and they were particularly interested in knowing how the NGIS is rolling out, what's working, what's not, and how it could work better. So we incorporated those questions. Uh, we formally interviewed 15 people with a disability, ranging uh, mostly adults as well as 20 parents of some of those adults, but also parents of children. Um, and we formally interviewed 13 disability service staff, so drive-in, drive-out service, but we also informally consulted with many, many more, pretty much anyone who came around the NJS. We invited them to come to Mana and chat with us. And then um, we walked alongside at least 20 people uh, to help them access the NDIS and attended any consultation or aware um, information sessions that the NDA ran. And then from that, uh, we had a look at uh, some of the policies around how the NDIS started and put that together with all the work that Manon's already been doing around disability um, into this report. So it was um, something I did on the side of my full-time Sydney Uni job on Sundays for about a year. <laughs> um, but Manon also invested a lot of their time. We had community navigators for every single person that we interviewed so that it was done the right way. And Emily, was there anything else that you wanted to add to that or, or speak to in particular about that experience of the consultation and preparation of the report? Um, other than to say that we um, was actually forced into doing this, we had no alternative but to really highlight what was going on for people because there wasn't anything for them. Or in any avenue for proper yeah. consultation. Yeah. yeah. So things were falling on deaf ears, for want of a better phrase, prior to that opportunity. Mm. And in the report, it talks about what an ordinary, what the ordinary life looks like for a person with disability in Fitzroy Valley. Emily, are you able to share with the commissioners what that looks like? What that looks like at the for, moment. Yeah, for a person with disability in, in Fitzroy Crossing or the Valley. Well, earlier you would have heard, you know, we had a lady that talked about her disability. But look, life is very hard for anyone living in such a remote place who has a disability. And just to actually exist on a day-to-day -day basis, being able to try and navigate the world for the day is very hard for most people. Whether you, you're in a wheelchair or you have some cognitive disability, it is really hard. And we rely on family members to be able to do that work for our, for our family who has a disability. Because we live so remote, one of the things I did talk about, uh, whilst I talk about, oh, people don't know what good looks like, it, why should we, in such small remote towns, miss out on services um, for the community when our town is 98% Indigenous population? That's the town and the surrounding community. So we're predominantly an Indigenous town. We need, uh, this is a human rights issue I'm talking about here. People with disabilities should be able to be afforded the same level of service and to be able to live a good life as somebody that's living in a regional town or in cities. But it, it's not happening here in small places like the Fitzroy crossings of the world and our remote communities. And that's, and people shouldn't have to decide to move to be able to get that. And leave their family and leave their connection to country and culture and all the support systems around them just to get a service. I would have 
And we're on the highway. We're on the highway. And this is what brought us to this, to do this report, because we needed to raise the voices of the families that are in desperate situations around their families with disability. Thank you. Uh, Lauren, was there anything that you wanted to add or in particular highlight in in terms of barriers that prevent those um, lifestyles for people in community? Um, Yeah, I mean, when I first came here, I could not believe how different it was to Sydney and how little access to services there were, particularly because I was familiar with the Little One Project and I knew that um, it got a lot of awareness Uh, both nationally and internationally, everybody knew the rate of disability here. So to come here and find that I, who have a PhD in disability, couldn't find anyone to help diagnose children with disabilities or to find disability services or to get speech or OT, and, uh, yeah, it was just shocking. Um, I I think going back to your question about an ordinary life, one thing I really liked that was highlighted in everybody's comments today and I think is so vital is every single person we interviewed, not only for this report, but for the Biggest One Kid Project, which was 194 other people, um, said that they love living here and they want to live here. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of great things and there's so many protective factors, the kinship system just blows me away in how protected people feel. I've had the fortune of walking alongside people with disability who live here and then who have to go to Perth for services um, and to see how comfortable they feel and having a psych, like a, an, an undergraduate degree in psychology, it makes so much sense if you have a cognitive impairment, but your, your place is predictable. You know how life works and you feel safe and you know who everybody is. You have so much more freedom. And as soon as they go to Perth, their world becomes so small and they're scared to leave because there's all these language and cultural barriers in not understanding how to navigate the world, but then throw a cognitive impairment on top of it and it's just impossible. Um, So, yeah, I think there are lots and lots of barriers, but at the same time there's also lots and lots that could be happening uh, that just isn't, and and I was shocked to Mm. see that. Well, what sort of things do you think should be happening? When, well, I think the NDIS is a huge scheme, like it's the biggest health reform since Medicare, so we knew it wasn't going to be rolled out perfectly straight away, but it was disappointing to see how little consultation there was. I think they just had to get it out, and now that it's out, it would be great if there was proper consultation to ensure it's place-based and um, designed for each community or each region. One thing I've noticed is that Fitzroy is very different to Halls Creek, to Derby and to Broome. Um, so I think there needs to be consultation. And one thing somebody very smart said to me when I first came here and to the NDIA when we were in one of the meetings and which Madge reiterated is if you do not go to sleep here and you don't wake up here, you don't understand here. I have done all of these interviews, I've read all of this work, I've spoken to all these people, but it's walking alongside people and living here that's taught me everything. So I think having an NDA representative in Services Australia who can actually see the barriers but also the solutions I think is vital. The introduction of the remote community connectors at Marawara is great, but it's only half the puzzle. All of the other region uh, towns that have AMSs, they have the remote community connector, but they also have evidence access and plan coordination. We don't have that because we don't have an AMS. And it means that knowledge around the NDIA and the complexity of the NDIA isn't understood. Um, And so you've got people who are trying to help community understand the NDIS, but they don't understand it and they don't have that support. Um, And I think having Uh, that component based here as well the plans are so confusing I still Mm. do not understand the language they're designed to be I I assume they're designed that every section everyone with a disability has but some 50 year old man in Tasmania versus seven year old here is completely different and so it's become so the headings for the sections of the plans are so vague they mean nothing I'm constantly having to write next to them to remind myself what they are so I can explain them to someone Dr. So I think I, I yeah. wonder if this might 
consider slowing down just <laughs> just a little sorry, because sorry. we have to translate into Auslan and have the real-time transcript. Oh, yeah. sorry. I reassure you, you're not the first person that uh, has received <laughs> that, uh, And you're definitely not the first person to tell me that I talk too fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that they're having somebody in services Australia, having a locally based evidence and access person to help create the plans. Um, but then also once people have plans, the support coordinator and specialized support coordinator roles in like the concept is, a, is fantastic and exactly what's needed to help navigate the complexity of the scheme, but they're not based here. And at the moment, I am constantly having to advocate for them to do what they're supposed to be doing. And I, the pattern we've noticed is that their support coordinators are part of a disability service that also provides allied, allied health therapy. And they're very good at making sure that allied health therapy goals are achieved, but not the other goals, like getting the wheelchair fixed and other resources. Um, and I think if they were based here, they would be much more accountable but they would also be able to work with the community to break down barriers. Um, and then lastly, the specialised support coordinator. So many of the plans that have been written that I've sat in on, the plan I was like, yeah, this person needs a specialised support coordinator. They're homeless. They have a mental illness. They're experiencing DV. All of these things need to be broken down before they can access disability services. We have funding and a pathway to do it, but there's no specialised support coordinators here and it's beyond the NDIS to have to provide that because disability services are private. So they're just some of the solutions that we have in our um, report and I guess a lot of it comes down to making more place-based services. Emily, was there anything else that you would like to talk about in terms of the solutions for your community? Look, I, no, not really. I just wanted to reinforce what Lauren has said, that we need to have someone here on the ground. Um, I listened earlier on today to, um, to Topsy's, um, Topsy talking, and the old Disability Commission was a better service for our people because there was a physical presence on the ground that was, that was very um, user friendly and people were able to go in and talk about what was going on for them, how they could access services and that, that's where it's all fallen down. When in this new service, people don't know where to go and what to do. And we've gone into this as an organisation, really. We've fallen into this because of, the, because of our biggest one research that we, that we had to get into this to understand what was going on for people here on the ground. And today we've heard evidence from a number of people who've been living in, in the Valley um, talking about the lack of cultural foundation that there exists in the NDIS. Um, what have been your observations on the ground in terms of cultural capacity for the scheme? Well, look, one of the things that I've spoken about is the fact that families, Indigenous families, really aren't recognised by um, NDIS at all. The way the... I'm, I'm not a full bottle on, you know, the whole of NDIS. It's, a, it's really big and that. But what I see on the ground is families looking after their own family member who has a disability. But in the current system, those families cannot be paid to do the work for them. And when we're talking about a cultural system, in the Aboriginal culture, it is our responsibility to care for our family members, and especially the vulnerable in our, in our um, families. But there, no one recognises the caregiving that goes on within that family. 
that we do or families do this day in, day out. They're saving governments a lot of money, but because they're family, they're not being paid for the work that they're doing in giving care to their loved ones. That's a flaw, I think. And the family will always do that regardless. When we're talking about res respite and that, no one's going to really access respite because it means going out of Fitzroy Crossing. But they'll probably give an extended family, their family member to care for so they can get respite. But they can't access money because they are related I think the other thing is that NDIS has been set up more like a business and Aboriginal people are really scared to go into that part as well. Why should I have to get an ABN and register as a loan provider for my family or for a relative for, or for an, a kid? Um, a vulnerable person just down the road there. So it's become a business and that makes people scared as well. So, and there's got to be flexibility in this system. And can I just say, NDIS has been set up looking at everything in a very Western lens. There's been no consideration given to Indigenous peoples of this country or people of minority where English isn't their first language and we're supposed to navigate this system. And so there's a, a need for interpreters as a starting point? Interpreters. Everything is online. We want to be able to see these people. We want face-to-face -face contact with the people that's supposed to be from that can give you clear, clear information. We want to be able to um, have people in there that understands that we are a diverse group of people and that how do we make sure that our culture and customs is recognised and respected so that our families can get a ser good service, understanding that cultural and practices and that for our mob. Because for us, it all, it's the obligation or if things go wrong, there are stuff that happens in the cultural sense. They're the things that got to be taken into consideration. And the only way that's going to happen is if we have somebody that comes and lives and understand and build the relationships with our communities. Now, in terms of trying to get some more capacity building within Fitzroy, was Marlon Montequera approached to start delivering services at some stage? Initially, yes. Initially, we were approached. And, of course, at that time, I, um, I felt that the responsibility was being pushed onto NGOs, you know, to ACOs, especially Mani Montagura and Marawara, the Aboriginal Resource Centre just down the road here. And we knocked that back and we continue to knock it back because this is the government service. They have a responsibility in providing this service. We as ACOs have so much, we do our own work, but we have so much expectations on us that we're just overwhelmed sometimes. And I did say no. 
Uh, are there also other complexities that exist, such as the lack of housing for a staff member to deliver on those services? Exactly. We don't have... We're a ACO. We get funded for programs to deliver programs and, and to employ staff, but we don't get funded to provide housing at all. It's, it, it's at our expense that we have to find housing in the community for our staff. But we do a lot of government work. Lauren, I wanted to get your views about um, how NDIS service managers, coordinators and support services coming to the Valley uh, to deliver services. Are there concerns held by participants about how money is being spent for transportation costs? As in for the drive in and out? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think because it's so complex, people just get given this, this piece of paper with however much money on it, $40,000, and it's not explained to them how it's supposed to be used. And often with the first plan, it's hard to know what things are going to cost. I know there were five or six people I sat with and in the first planning meeting they said, so we'll give you this much, but then you'll get connected to a support coordinator and to services and, you know, if your service is based here, then you know, the price might be lower, but if your service is based in Broome or Darwin, then you'll get more money to cover the extra costs. Um, and then there are no services based here. Um, even, even the locally based service here still has a drive-in, drive-out allied health therapy. And the staff turnover for those services is incredibly high because they get inundated with way too many people and it's not feasible. Um, and so there are a lot of costs coming out and people don't really understand why. Um, and those non-Aboriginal services don't have uh, community navigators. You mentioned, and you were talking to Emily about the importance of interpreter, but it's so much more than an interpreter. Mm -hmm. um, having an interpreter from even Broome speaking Creole on the phone to someone isn't going to make them feel comfortable to speak about their child's disability. And that's one thing that I've learned is it has to be somebody who lives here who says to the family, this non-Aboriginal person's okay, you can trust them. And straight away, the whole conversation is different. So these drive-in, drive-out services don't have that. So sometimes people, particularly people with cognitive disabilities, they won't open the door. So someone's driven all the way from Broome and then left again, and they have no idea who they are. They're just like another white Prado, could be anyone, could be Department of Communities. Um, and so they're like, why is money coming out of my plan when, when I haven't received the service? So there's a lot of communication issues, a lot of confusion around the way the money is spent. Um, and it's largely because you don't have the knowledge of the disability service uh, working alongside community navigators to explain it to the community. Uh, Emily, was there anything else that you'd like to add to that? Um, yeah, other than to say that um, I was just thinking, I know it's not in my statement, but when Lauren was talking, I was thinking about a young family some years ago who had a plan for their little boy and she didn't know what it all meant. And she was entitled to... Um, Kimbies for a little for her little boy for a year, and she never ever accessed that because no one explained that plan to her. And from what I understand, if you're not accessing something in your plan, say this year, the money is less next year. So, and these are people that are already living in poverty. And had she known that she could have accessed this stuff, that would have made life a lot easier for her. So as simple as knowing that you could buy nappies under the plan. Yes. As simple as keeping receipts. She bought the nappies. But when yeah. we finally were introduced to her and explained this to her and advocated for her, they said, if you don't have the receipts, you can't get the money back. Mm -hmm. Now, Emily, 
you know, we earlier spoken about solutions, but do you think the NDIS is fit for purpose? Um, no, I don't. I really don't. I think we're seeing even more suffering now than when it was in the old Disability Commission. Honestly, and people have to come and have a look to see what I'm talking about. There is, there is no services for these people. And if there was services or there are few services, but one of the things I want to also say who gives an oversight to all of these providers to make sure that they're doing the right thing? Because we're talking about money and I, I don't see that there's any governance in that part of being a service provider and whether they're being accountable. Lauren, do you have any views about whether the scheme is fit for purpose in particular for the Valley? Yeah, I've seen it work so well in Sydney. And every time I go back to Sydney and talk to parents of kids with disabilities, I just get so frustrated at what people aren't getting here. And I honestly think, because I, I started interviewing people before the NDIS rolled out, and that, like life is just, yeah, that's my child and that's just the way it is. And then someone comes along, the NDA come along and say, you can have respite, your child can talk with speech therapy, you can have a wheelchair, you can have all these things, here's $60,000, and then they disappear. It's like they've created this hope and this expectation and then let them down. They would have been better off just not, not knowing about it. Mm. So is there a sense in the community of empty promises? Yeah, and yeah. The, the frustrating thing for me is the NDA were warned about that. I sat in the room where Emily and others said, please don't promise services that don't exist. Build up the services, then tell people about the scheme. And they said, sign people up and the services will come. We've signed up. There's Well, there was at least 80 people connected to one service um, and they only have two staff. The services have not come. Um, and has that been the experience of, of Mudge in respect of his other children that might also live with disability? What? Yeah, poor Mudge. I don't, I've walked alongside him throughout the whole process and I hate how many forms I have to ask him to complete and how many meetings I have to ask him to sit in just to get a couple of speech therapy sessions. He only does it because we encourage him to persist he definitely would have given up otherwise and he's trying to do it because he wants to try and break down the barriers and improve the services for all his other family um, who have disabilities but it, it yeah hasn't happened yet. Um, Emily is there a sense in in your community of fatigue when it comes to inquiries in Royal Commissions? Oh, yeah, I think, well, I know that I, there's a sense of fatigue with me when um, we sit here and we watch and, um, you know, we've seen the, um, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody We've seen the Bringing Them Home report, the Stolen Generation. We've seen, you know, the Aged Care Royal Commission, the Banking Royal Commission. And you get, you wonder when things will change for the better for people on the ground. And certainly I will always advocate for, for women and children here in the Fitzroy Valley, as long as I'm able to stand and talk and breathe. But you wonder when things will change for the better. 
And I would like to say to our commissioners and Commissioner Mason, I know personally, and that when all this is done, there's going to be recommendations made to the government. But somewhere, I have hope in this new government that things will change for the better. Um, that this government's going to listen because we're sick of telling our story. We're sick of it. And bringing up the pain that we have and to see our people struggle and how we fit into a very Western system. There's got to be flexibility in this system so our people benefit. And I really, really hope that the commission does this because we are very, we have a lot of vulnerable children out there that needs to have, to be able to live a good life. And things are hard. That's all I've got to say. Lauren, was there anything else that you wish to tell the commissioners? No, thank you. I think Emily said it all. Thank you very much, uh, uh, both uh, Ms Carter and uh, Dr Rice. I'll ask uh, Commissioner Mason first whether she has any questions that she would like to put to you. Um, thank you both of you for your evidence um, this afternoon. Um, I uh, was going to go back in history uh, and talk about the advocacy and the work that uh, has happened in the Fitzroy Valley to challenge and to find another way to support families and around the trauma that comes through alcohol and then the consequence um, we're talking about through the Disability Royal Commission uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, living in Central Australia um, and our challenges in this region around uh, petrol sniffing, um, I look at your region, I think of this region, that the um, understanding of, uh, of trauma but also of disabilities coming through because of that the social breaking down of family structures and and that history Emily you talked about stolen generation we've heard a lot about that in this hearing today so I've got a question about that um, looking at those years and where we are today why why what's your thinking around why services were not built up when the understanding of the extent of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder particularly was known about in the Fitzroy Valley. Why the delay, um, and there's still a delay from your evidence today, why, why didn't that happen once the, um, the, the truth was starting to really be understood by researchers and governments in the Fitzroy Valley starting way back there in the mid 2000s? Well, I don't think our Western Australian government took the, took the research very serious, took it seriously enough. Um, from the evidence that came out of the first um, prevalence, where you are, um, Commissioner Mason in Alice Springs, there is a centre there that will that supports children with FASD and uh, you know the diagnostic teams there. There is one in every city, every in, city Australia. in Australia. Yeah. Um, but there isn't anything here on the ground. So a lot of people, a lot of the services right across the country benefited from the research here in Fitzroy, except for Fitzroy. Except for the Kimberley. Or the Kimberley area itself. So um 
And that's the truth. Yes, I can, I understand that. And the realisation of that is very sobering because you're still in that situation now. Um, my second question um, is about the stolen generation mm -hmm. and the impact of that. And um, I just had a question. It's not in your uh, statement, uh, but should the NDIS be giving particular considerations to families with disability, um, family members with disability, particularly uh, where there has been that impact of the stolen generation and even today with children in the child protection system coming out and being uh, uh, channeled towards uh, the NDIS, being institutionalised. So we've got, you know, multi-generations of First Nations people and the impact of the stolen generation and removal. Do you think the NDIS should be being, paying, should be playing particular attention to those families because of that history? Yes, I think so. I really do. Um, um, as we all know, um, trauma is a big one for all of our families. And the stolen generation had a huge impact right across the Kimberley area. And that is passed on. When we talk about intergenerational trauma, that is passed on. That is true. That is our lived reality on the ground here. And it stops you from being able to um, being able to um, function properly in this world. I'm I'm a descendant of stolen generation parents. But for me, what happened to them is what drives me to do the work that I do. But there are other families who's never ever recovered because of what's happened to their families. And that when you think about um, people with a disability, it's not always a physical disability, but it's that it's hard to explain the, the, the inside there's a disability for you because of what's happened. It takes, it's more than just your parents being removed, it's you as the person needing to know how you're connected to people and country and, you know, all your heritage stuff, that creates really bad mental illness for families if you don't know who you are. As a person, we all need to know who we are and how we're, where we come from and how we're connected. And there's stolen generation that hasn't found that yet and that causes serious illnesses for them where, you, where we say you get sick from the inside out and can never function through this world. Thank, thank you. Um, and my last question, you know, words matter for First Nations people because we have the oral tradition. So explaining and, and also the concrete experiences, our education system, don't tell me about it, show me how to do it. Um, and so this word insurance seems to be uh, a, blo a block. It's a block. It's a, a block in the understanding of how this system works because the Disability Services Commission in WA, a former commission, because of that word service and it attached to disability, um, our countrymen and women understood mm. what that organisation was meant to be doing. Yeah. Um, and it did, did it. It was providing services, as you've both explained today. 
So is the word insurance, the insurance, is, is insurance a sophisticated word that has not actually really found its place within First Nations literacy? I'm talking across the board, not just people that have gone to university, First Nations, yeah. but the mums and dads, do they understand that even that concept of insurance? Exactly. Like, you know, I, I um, that is a very, very foreign word for all of us, including myself. But when we think about the five language groups here in the Fitzroy Valley, not always English is their first language. So it is foreign to us. And... Um, um, who came up with national disability insurance, God knows, um, I wouldn't have put people with a disability under an insurance scheme. Doesn't, it is foreign. Um, you've used the, you talked about the homelands movement. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's something in that, um, as you were giving your evidence today, around the language of how First Nations people can understand really what this benefit of the NDIS could bring, because there was also that similar hope about the, mo the, the homelands movement. I'm just I'm probably going over time now, but mm. I just want to say thank you. You've really um, stimulated and awakened some really interesting thinking for me. But I also want to thank your organisation for its heavy lifting in the area of social policy, but also of healing and of finding ways to solve these really difficult problems that we've experienced in remote communities. So thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Mason. Uh, Commissioner McEwen, do you have any questions? Uh, no question for me other than to say thank you both, not only for your evidence today, but also for the work that your organisation does in supporting your local community. Thank you. Uh, Dr Rice, I'd just like to know a little bit more about the uh, report, People Don't Know What Good Looks Like Creating Equity for People with Disability in the Fitzroy Valley. Was the funding for that exclusively through the NDIA? So, the NDA provided us with funding to do it, um, but we Marnin provided additional funding and then I'm employed through the University of Sydney um, through a fellowship for other research. So there, it, it costs more than what the NDA provided, but yes, they did provide funding. And then there was in-kind support from Marnin and the University of Sydney. What was the object of the exercise from the point of view of the NDIA as you understood it? So the, the NDIA's objectives or aims are outlined in the report. They were really interested in understanding what a good life looks like and what type of supports people might want. It was, um, but when I spoke to senior people in the community about whether we would do this and what they wanted, they obviously wanted a lot more um, because it's not just telling the NDIA what a good life looks like. It's there's a lot more than that, telling the NDA all the barriers to trying to implement such a big thing, telling the NDA what life is like here, how different disability is perceived in Aboriginal communities. Um, so we went, I guess, above and beyond their objective, but they were quite supportive for us to do that. In your uh, statement at paragraph 71 and following, you address the situation since the report was written. I understand uh, from what you have said in the statement, including at uh, paragraph 26, that there was no response from the minister. Has there been a response from the NDIA? No. So the people from the NDIA um, in the Connectors branch who were working with us on this, there were three people and they all left over the time that we did it. Um, and a new person was appointed as the lead for that. And the summary of the report was sent to them just after Minister Linda Reynolds came and, and received our report um, and we didn't hear anything back from them. I was informed more recently that the report was, they had two meetings about it, they reviewed it and discussed it, but they never reached out to us. I think when we did have the full report ready to go, it was right before the election. 
Um, so I think everything was on the standstill. So we're excited now that the new um, government is in to start working with uh, Minister Bill Shorten and the NDA in discussing how some of these recommendations could be implemented. Yes, I was going to ask you, the report uh, was completed in uh, by at least September 2021, and it's now up on a website, as I understand it. Is that right? Yes, that's right. The University of Sydney is going to formally launch the report. Has it all, uh, uh, in June 2022? Well, June, of course, has passed. Has the report been officially launched? Yes, just this week. Just so this it, week. it's been available and we've been sending it out to anyone we think might be interested. Um, but we decided to do a media statement to help raise awareness uh, to try and get some traction. Um, I see from uh, your very impressive curriculum vitae that you've been extremely successful in getting grants for research uh, studies that include studies in remote Indigenous communities. Are any of the studies that are referred to in your CV, other than the one uh, in effect commissioned by the NDIA, any of those relate to Fitzroy? All of them. All of all the ones, all of the Indigenous ones relate to Fitzroy. Um, so I was invited by Emily um, and Professor Elizabeth Elliott, who Emily's worked with for 12 years, to come up into the community and work with them on the Biggest One Kid project, following up the children from the Little One project 10 years later. So most of those grants relate to that work. Um, we've recently just completed following up <coughs> people and 100 parents. Um, all of the young people who were diagnosed with FASD in the original study 10 years ago, we were able to interview them and find out how they're doing now. And we're currently working on analysing and writing that up. And uh, have, have the uh, results of those research projects been made available among other, among other government entities to the NDIA? Yes, so Manan being such an impressive organisation, one of the things that surprised me is how many ministers and DGs come through. Um, and so we use that opportunity and commissioners, so the Mental Health Commissioner, the State Child and Young People Commissioner, Minister Simone McGurk, who was here last week? Um, the Minister of Mental Health. Yeah, so anyone who comes through, we let them know about the findings and any findings that come up, like when the suicide rates when we started to notice how high they were, we actively inform government to make sure they're aware. Sometimes it's a little like dealing with a revolving door. Mm, it is. I suspect. Yes. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, thank you both uh, very much, both for the work that you do. Again, I echo what uh, Commissioner Mason uh, has said, and I know she's very familiar with the work that you do, and uh, what Commissioner McEwen has said, and thank you for the contributions you made in the written statement uh, and in the evidence that you have given uh, today, and of course, in the research work that you have both uh, carried out. So thank you very much, and thank you for the, we very much appreciate the contributions to the Royal Commission. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rago, I think that Mr. Griffin is approaching again. Can I indicate, uh, Chair and Commissioners, that we anticipate starting at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning with the written statement being read of Paulette. The schedule is in accordance with the schedule that's been provided to you previously. And can I indicate to my colleagues who have leave to appear that I would expect that we'll get to the Commonwealth evidence at around three tomorrow. Thank you. In that case, we shall adjourn until 10 a.m. Uh, tomorrow, Central Time. The Royal Commission is now adjourned.